welcome, good morning, everybody, to the uh, November meeting of the Save Our Indian River Lagoon um, Committee, uh, Advisory Committee. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, so we'll go ahead and do a roll call. Jackie? Okay. Uh, Lorraine Cox? Here. Charlie Ludo? Not here. Vinny Toronto? Here. Uh, John Windsor? Here. Terry Pasto? Here. David Lane? Not here. Laura Lee Thompson? Here. Stephanie Ely? Here. Kimberly Newton? Is not here. Uh, Courtney Barker? Here. Todd Swingle? Susan Hodgers? Here. And Eric Vance. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so the first thing um, you guys might have heard, uh, the voice from above, Stephanie. Um, and so she uh, is uh, on the phone. So uh, I'd look for a motion to accept um, remote votes if there is. So any. moved. Okay. Second. All right. Um, any discussion? Any public comment? Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and vote on that motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, welcome officially Stephanie. All right, uh, the next thing we'll do um, is the approval of the agenda, um, but I would like to um, add, move, add, move one thing. So uh, we have, <laughs> or suggest one thing, we have our internal audit um, presentation today. And so what I'd like to do, since it's fiscal year 2022, is move it up before 5B. So before we get our new um, financials, um, I'd like to go ahead and hear the presentation from the audit, get last year tucked into bed, and then we'll move forward. So is there a, a motion to move uh, the audit up to uh, before 5B? Motion to move. Okay. All right, first and a second. Any comment or discussion? Okay, any public comment? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next item, the approval of the minutes. Um, so I'll look for a motion for that. Motion to approve. All right, I've got a motion from Dr. Windsor. Is there a second? Second. All right, second from Laura Lee. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? They were riveting. Um, <laughs> any public comment? They were Jackie's first. I loved them. They were amazing. All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Minutes passed. They are official. All right. So let's go ahead. We'll do our monthly progress report. And then auditors, you are up to, ba up on, uh, up to bat after. Microphone. Good morning. Um, this is also uh, the quarterly progress and performance, and so I'm just going to skip um, things that are going to come up later on that quarterly presentation. But I wanted to start with the top of the list. The South Central D Septic to Sewer Project held a community meeting with homeowners last night. Really good attendance. Very positive. Um, meeting with the community uh, explaining what to expect with that septic to sewer project. You've asked a few times about uh, plumbing services, so we did an RFQ request for qualifications to seek additional plumbers to be able to help uh, folks get leaky lateral re repairs done and have the plumbers paid directly by the county. Uh, we have now pre-qualified six plumbers, so that was a successful effort. Skipping down, we removed one more derelict vessel this month. Of course, the hurricane uh, generated a whole lot more derelict vessels, and so we are working with the agencies to get those vessels uh, identified and processed and hopefully get owners to deal with uh, as many as possible, and then we will work on removal of those that are, that are cleared for, um, that are designated as derelict and cleared for removal. And the terms 
for 10 of the oversight committee members were renewed by the county commission. Um, and we were directed to advertise for four potential vacancies. And so that advertisement has, has gone out a number of different ways. Um, we've received five applications so far. We do not have any applicants for real estate yet. So um, just another shout out, we, we need um, applicants for real estate. The applications are posted on the county's website. So if anyone is interested, uh, if you can please share and do your best to recruit good members um, to this to this great body. What's the deadline, Virginia? Sorry, I didn't November mean November 28th. Thank you. I actually had a note to say that. And no I, worries. Yeah. November 28th. Yes. All right. And we have been uh, very busy in the last month working on the 2023 draft plan updates uh, and going through the 17 project applications that you have in your packet and getting those uh, as complete as possible for your consideration. Um, and we have completed uh, all the uh, coordination we needed to do with the auditors for the 2022 audit. Uh, and they gave their presentation to the county's audit committee on November 14th. And you'll hear more about that in their presentation to you shortly. On presentations this month, um, Brandon presented to the East Merritt Island Homeowners Association, uh, Terry uh, was invited by um, Charlie Venuto to present to the Merritt Island Wildlife Association. And I was invited to go to the Manatee Forum over in St. Pete. You know, they're obviously very concerned about the impacts of the water quality and seagrass losses in the lagoon on the manatee population. And we're interested in what uh, we were doing about trying to improve the, the ecology of the system and uh, how that will help manatees. Uh, Indian River Lagoon Day, um, uh, dis despite the chillier, cooler, windier weather, uh, that was a successful event on November 5th. And then um, Boaters Exchange, you know, this is a, a private event that really appeals to a, a different kind of um, audience that spends a lot of time on the water. Um, so Terry and Jean uh, worked that event. It's always, we always look forward to that one. Um, and then just a note that the Indian River Lagoon Coalition is gonna have a straight talk event in Titusville on January 19th. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, one addition at the top of the list of future topics. Earlier this week, we received the Seagrass Guidance Risk Assessment Tool. Uh, we are still trying to get it loaded in GIS and play with the dials and buttons and see how it goes, but um, we look forward to presenting that to you shortly and uh, talking about how we expect it to be useful. And that's a tool that was partially funded from the, the yes. Sorrel Funds. Yes, awesome. right. The idea is to help people understand, you know, planting seagrass in the lagoon, anywhere in the lagoon is a high risk endeavor, but how do you use the data that we have for the water quality and sediment and shoreline conditions to identify those areas that are uh, the lowest potential risk um, where we might want to start with seagrass planting um, and how you would design your seagrass planting projects in such a way and monitor them in such a way that we can, everybody that is doing these projects feeds, collects information and feeds that to each other so we learn from these projects going forward. All right. Okay. Great, thank you. And um, Laura Lee, you said you saw some seagrass somewhere. I saw you at that uh, speech with Terry, which by the way, ah. Thank you, Charlie and, and Laura Lee, for inviting Terry and I uh, to speak a lot. I got emails after saying, um, now, thank you very much. Now I feel more comfortable where the money is going. So um, I think events like that are, are great. Um, and, and I'm free. I mean, people may leave when I get up on stage. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but I don't charge anything. But Laura Lee, talk, you, you mentioned a little bit about some seagrass that you saw. Where were you at? Yeah, that was in Southern Mesquite Lagoon. And, and thank you. You and Terry were amazing at... at and at the 
Merit, that was at the Merritt Island Wildlife Association annual dinner. So we're the support group for the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and also at the Strait Talk too. The, those presentations need to be, they need to be, they need to go on the road because it, I did, I had so many people come up to me afterwards and say, wow, that was incredible. Now I understand. And so I think those, those presentations are valuable. So Southern Mosquito Lagoon, the seagrass um, in, some pl in some places, just in a year, there's a 25% coverage. It might be even more, because um, Chuck Jacoby made me a graph back in July for the Merritt Island Wildlife Association newsletter. And at that point in time, they had some transects that had 25% coverage. I mean, they've gone from zero to 25% coverage in, in one summer. But we've had two successive summers with no major algae bloom in the Southern Mosquito Lagoon. Um, and I think that this is such a powerful indicator of how quickly this damaged system could recover if we would just stop putting nutrients and sewage into it. Because in the Southern Mosquito Lagoon, there's no stormwater ponds, there's no ditches, there's no wastewater treatment facilities. Um, dumping overflow into the system. So it, it's, a, it's a very good example of what, what could happen. Um, the, in July, the NASA scientists um, or a contractor or somebody flew a helicopter and did a manatee count in the southern Mosquito Lagoon. And this is basically just from a little bit north of Hallover Canal to the south end of the lagoon. They counted 858 manatees. We normally would have around 500 manatees in, in the northern Indian River Lagoon and southern Mosquito Lagoon in the summertime because the manatees go other places. Manatees came to Mosquito Lagoon this summer because there was something to eat. And um, it's, uh, I think there's, there's probably a thousand animals that were there all summer long. We had tons of manatees in Mosquito Lagoon. I mean, I'm, not, I'm sorry, in Hallover Canal at the manatee viewing deck. I mean, tourists were ecstatic all summer long. I, I saw them behaving normally this, this year. They mated, they, they frolicked, they, they acted normal for the first time in, in several years. It was so refreshing. And, and so let that be a lesson, you know. Th there's hope, there is actually hope. And I'm not seeing any, hardly any sign of seagrass in the northern Mesquite, or I'm sorry, northern Indian River, like in the Titusville area. Um, we had tons of seagrass rolling up on the shoreline um, at this place where I was, you know, able to harvest seagrass rhizomes all summer long to send to sea and shoreline. So a lot of these restoration projects, they're going to be using that Mosquito Lagoon seagrass when, we, when it's time to plant in the, in the river. Um, during, uh, the, during Nicole, tons and tons of seagrass blew up. It's not on the shore. It's actually like wrapped around the trunks of the mangrove trees and hanging from the limbs like Christmas tinsel all along the western shore <laughs> of southern Mosquito Lagoon. Um, conversely, I was at Gator Creek Beach yesterday, um, and there, the, the uh, grassalaria and calerpa mixture, nasty, rotting, stinking, it's three feet high in some places. I, I've never, I couldn't even imagine, but that's what, that's what in the northern Indian River versus what's in the southern Mosquito Lagoon. So again, You've got all of these nutrients coming from the city of Titusville. I, I believe that there's still stuff coming from the sewage spill from two years ago in those stormwater ponds still going out into the lagoon. So we have massive grass area and calerpa and no seagrass. I, I, I dug through those piles yesterday just trying to find any rhizomes, and I, I found one or two, but there's nothing. Yeah. You know, we just we got to stop putting stuff in the lagoon. And, and that's why the work of this committee and, and the work of Brevard County is so important. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for the opportunity to speak. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't get as many opportunities to get on the water as I'd like. I don't know how many. I'm sure a lot of us do, but if there's anybody who can speak from experience on the water, it's, it's Laura Lee. So thank you for that, um, Laura Lee. All right, okay. please. 
I just wanted to say that uh, I think it was maybe it was late October and I wasn't here last month, but Terry did a presentation in Cocoa and same thing. I mean, we need more of those because I think everyone walked away much more confident in this plan and particularly there the controversy around septic to sewer where you have people resisting that. I mean, I think that, um, that I was really impressed by your presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lorraine. Okay, any other questions on Virginia's uh, monthly progress report? Questions or comments? All right, so let's go ahead and move into the 2022 audit. Good morning, thank you for having us here today. I'm Laura Manlove, I'm a director with RSM. I work out of our um, Vieira office over here and um, have been serving the county for uh, almost five years and serving the larger Brevard County area for almost 20 years. So pleasure to be here in front of you today. I think this is my first time appearing before you but not my first time at Brevard County. Um, today presenting the audit results is gonna be Jamie Bardi. You've probably seen her in the past presenting past audit reports and I'm gonna hand it off to her to walk you through the details of our audit. Good morning, thank you. So this is our sixth audit um, of the SORO program. This is for fiscal year 2022. Our scope period for this audit was October 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. We confirmed 100% um, of the revenues. We also in this audit look at expenditures as well as the procurement process. And so with that, I will go through everything that we tested. For the revenue, the collections, we tested 100% of those through the Florida Department of Revenue and no exceptions were noted. The next section we tested was the expenditures. There were 11.5 million expenditures during our scope period that funded 64 active projects. Of those, we sampled 14 of those projects, which included 52 invoices that we tested during this process. Of that, it was 49% of the total soil expenditures that were tested. During that testing, there was one low finding um, observed during this audit. And so with that, I'll explain what that one um, finding was. So one of the invoices that we tested, one of the 52, was missing a signature um, from the Director of Natural Resources. Now, this invoice was reviewed. It was signed off by two other people before Virginia, and it was reviewed by her, but it was kicked back before her signature, and then it was sent to um, finance before she had a chance to sign. So it wasn't that it was not reviewed, but there was a procedural issue here. And so um, I do want to state that there were no funds misappropriated or erroneously expended during this. That has since been fixed and the process has been reviewed. During procurement testing, we tested all of the 14 projects that we sampled for expenditures. Additionally, we chose an additional RFP, ITB, and RFQ, and that's um, request for proposal, invitation to bid, and request for qualifications, just to make sure that during this fiscal year's testing, we looked at one of those that, were, that went through that entire process during this fiscal year. There were no exceptions noted during that. That is all I have to report. Are there any questions? All right, thank you, uh, Jamie. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Could I make the assumption that we don't have the report because it has to go to the commission first or? So we just, the initial audit committee meeting was canceled it, because they lost quorum. And so we did not present this until Monday afternoon. Okay. And so that's why there's been a delay and the initial agenda went out without us. Um, but we wanted to present to you as soon as possible after mm -hmm. that occurred. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And then the, uh, the audit report, Virginia will probably get it maybe next month in the packet or something? Yeah, we can put it in the packet. We can post it on our website where we have you know, all the audits posted. I think that would be great to have it on the website. But then also, if you could put it in our packet um, for the next monthly meeting we have, 
um, just for all of us to be able to see it. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. So now we'll go to the monthly revenue graph and financial statements by our one and only Crystal. Who's wearing bling today? Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just jealous, Crystal. I don't have any on. I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> the bedazzling mommy right here. <laughs> Sorry for the scrolling. No worries. <coughs> All right. So... In this graph, uh, you will see that we are at 283 million in collections. This is our cumulative total um, for our September collections. I'm sorry, August collections being at 4.2 million. Um, yesterday, I checked the site hoping that maybe I could give you a better update. We did receive our quarterly, which comes in September, but haven't received the September um, monthly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so the quarterly was at 3.1 million, which you do not see in this graph because I received it yesterday. Um, at this point, we have uh, this year at 59.8 million, and total altogether is 286.7 million, and we still have one more collection to receive. Right. So essentially what I just said for our collections up top um, at our 56.7 million, when in fact we are now at 59. Um, so our expenditures for FY22 um, were at 22.4 million overall budget, and um, we're at cumulative expenditures of just the Sorrel 454 million. Do we have any any questions thus far? I no questions here. Or the one the one thing on the chart, uh, I've just been and I know everybody has been paying attention to the graph, Crystal. If you could just scroll back to that, I was just looking at the slope of that line. You know, with all the talk um, of inflation and a possible recession, I just and I know. Virginia, you've done a great job of building that in. I remember we talked about it last year at the project plan. So I, I know for me, I'm just trying to keep my eye on that, on that slope. Um, uh, as we get to, there definitely were some good savings from projects we completed, which is awesome. Um, and so hopefully we can see more of that, uh, enough that if we, the line does uh, maybe start to flatten out, we'll, we'll still be good. All right. Yeah, so right here you can see that, that gap that's right above. So for the um, collection that we just re received, um, we are above projections at 5.1 million, but that doesn't fully include what this year is going to be. Yeah. That could go down, could go up. Thank you, Crystal. All right. So next we have our expenditures per project, our performance table um, at uh, our previous meeting, there was asked to be um, grayed out, and so you will see that that was done here. Explain what's gray. What is gray is um, when the project was put in the plan, so you said you did not want to see that until it was in place, so that's what you were seeing is grayed out. Thank so you. Um, you will know that it hasn't been sitting there for that entire time. Fantastic. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. Um, oh, grants. grants. There we are. Here are our grants. Um, were there any grants? Or any grants questions? <laughs> okay. No, I think it looks great. Thank you. All right. I think our financials are, are, other than being in a good place, I think that they're good the way they look. I think you all, Virginia and your staff, have done a great job um, of making it digestible but also very uh, informative. All right. 
Terry, it's all yours. So, oh, Terry, the, please. The, well, just to comment. So, looking at the stairway to heaven chart, climbing because. Uh, Mike, please. Oh, your is your mic on, Terry? Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I would just observe that we also need to take a look at the forecast of inflation on on project costs because at the end of the day, it's that difference that's you know that we're concerned about. So that's my only point. And I think when we talk, um, once we get the project plan, which is what we did last year, you know, that's when we can really look at our overall because we have some reserves. I know we put in additional inflation reserves last year. Um, so I, I think it's great, definitely something that once we get the whole plan together, we should talk about uh, and make sure that we're charting the best course we can. Yes, Eric. Um, I guess just a quick question. Do, is there a way or do we have any possibility of quantifying how much of that revenue is coming from tourism versus our own citizens? You know, I've seen a lot of estimates that it's on the order of 25 to 30 percent, but I don't know uh, exactly how that analysis is, is done, it's, you know, based on um, talking to our Tourism Development Council. Okay. So the state, because, Chris, we get some of those numbers from the state. Right, and so they don't separate it when it comes to you. No, I, I whether get it's a, in county or. The only thing that I know that is is not in county is this quarterly discretionary that we would just receive that we receive every quarter. Yes. And that's products bought out of county being brought into county. Okay. So that that's the only thing that we know, but they don't separate it by what they assume is is by right. our when travel. you go to the when you go to the store and you buy something they don't ask you are you a right. Where do you live? citizen are you, in or are you a visitor or so yeah yeah so we have to look at the visitor numbers and um, the TDC does surveys of visitors so often about how much do they spend while they're here and and so you have to look at sort of the GDP of expenditures in the county versus the survey results of what tourists say they're spending in the county to back into those numbers that might be interesting, though, Eric, if we reached out to the, the TDC to see if they could just once a year maybe give us what they the, what their survey results were, just to put in our packet just for us to see. That might yeah, be. I'd, I'd love to see it just because, you know, as we get more people coming here to catch snook and stuff, it might show an increase in revenue also. Yeah. You know. <laughs> okay, great. And, uh, Crystal, we're charging Jeff Bezos money for to see that discretionary uh, data, right? I mean, that's all Amazon purchases coming into our county. <laughs> so we're, we're charging him money to see how much money he's making in our county, right? I'm joking, by the way, Jeff. Don't, 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 don't do anything to me. All right. All right, great. Uh, thank you. Okay, I have a presentation for the performance for the progress this year, or this quarter. Um, but as you can see, as you flip through the performance table, you'll see there's a lot of yellow. That is an increase um, for all of the projects that had an increase this quarter. So you can see a lot of work has happened. And I think this is what we've always mm -hmm. thought. You know, the beginning of the project's going to take some time to get going, but then once it gets going. Yeah, they move along. Yeah. So I changed up the presentation a little bit for this quarter, kind of in preparation to go over the project list. So it's going to be a combination of an overview for the quarter and where we're at with all the projects. Um, so I already mentioned the yellow, just so you can recognize that. So our first project type on the list is project or public education. So on here we have the fertilizer, grass clippings, septic maintenance. Uh, well, there's a total of five projects for $2.4 million. And so uh, we just received the final report for the grass clippings campaign, and then the fertilizer and septic maintenance are at 63% completion. And our other two projects are the oyster gardening and the restore our shores. So we had oyster gardening for two years, and then that expanded into our restore our shores project, um, and that is at 10% completion right now. Our next project type is wastewater treatment facility upgrades for reclaimed water. We have a total of six projects, um, totaling almost $26 million. We have two of those projects already completed. That's the Cocoa Beach uh, Water Reclamation Facility and the Palm Bay North Facility. 
And then we have two actively under construction right now. The Titusville Osprey facility is at 76% completion. Um, their new treatment unit has been brought online, seated, and is treating wastewater. The North train is nearing completion and should be starting up very soon. Rockledge um, started uh, initial excavations this past quarter with next steps being the demolition of the existing sludge drying bed and then construction of the new bed. We have two more that are in the design phase. We have the Melbourne Grant Street Water Reclamation Rotter Reclamation Facility. This completed um, engineering and is expected to go out to bid in the next few months, so that one will be going under construction in 2023. And then we have the West Melbourne Ray Bullard Facility that completed 60% design and engineering. Our next project type is rapid infiltration basins and spray field upgrades. We have two projects. Um, one has been completed, that's the Long Point Park project, um, and this map here shows the um, basin with, uh, that had BAM material installed to treat that um, effluent. And then we have not yet contracted with the Sterling House condominium. Uh, we have uh, three package plant projects in the plan. Um, right now, Oak Point Mobile Home Park is under construction at 60% complete. This is going to connect 108 mobile home units um, to sewer. Um, we have, we have not yet contracted with Merritt Island Utility Company or Indian River Shores Trailer Park, but Merritt Island Utility Company recently let us know that they wanted to be removed from the plan, and that project was in there for $1.3 million. So that's why that's adjusted budget from 2.1 to 807,000. Um, we have five sewer lateral projects for $1.5 million. We recently completed the three smoke testing um, for Barefoot Bay, South Beaches, and Merritt Island. This smoke tested over 4,000 homes. I might have my 40,000. 40, 40, I, I thought I was off. <laughs> um, and then we have the homeowner repairs uh, budget, and that's underway for helping those homeowners fix those leaks. And to date, we have, or at the end of the quarter, we had 303 repairs completed, and we have not yet contracted with the um, Titusville Osprey Basin Lateral Project. So for septic to sewer projects, we have 42 projects in the plan um, for almost $120 million. We have quite a few under the construction phase. Um, South Central Sea has 65% construction completed. MICO sewer line extension, that contract was just awarded, so that one should be, and they're revising the plans to include, uh, what do you, sewage acceptance for the MICO B project, so that's happening and should be going to construction soon. Um, the next few are Melbourne's septic to sewer projects, um, so they've made a few connections with each of those. We have South Beaches O and P uh, currently in the bidding phase, so they're gonna be going out to bid together and that should be going to construction in the next year, hopefully, as well. So I know this is a lot of text on here, um, but this is where we're at with the in the design phase for all the uh, septic to sewer projects. And you can see on the list that there's a lot of yellow, so all of them have moved up in the last uh, quarter. And then we recently went to contract for Melbourne's Kent and Via Espana project and West Melbourne's Lake Ashley Circle and Dundee Circle and Manor Place projects. Um, we have completed three of those 42, I think it was, I said. <laughs> um, and I had the number, I think it was 243 connections, somewhere around there for all of the, that have been completed. Um, and then we have a few that um, have not yet gone to contract, but some work is underway for each of those um, with discussions with the cities on moving those projects forward. For our septic upgrades and quick connects, this quarter, so we have a total of 29 million um, allocated for our septic upgrade projects. This quarter we had 15 upgrades between the three uh, Lagoon subbasin, so two more were added in Banana, five in the north, and eight in the central, so we have a total of 98. Um, and then we had one additional quick connect in the central Indian River Lagoon. The table you have says three on central, and it should be two. That was my mistake, so um, 
just to bring that to your attention that one number is off. And we have $11 million associated for uh, the Quick Connect budget. Our next project type is stormwater projects. We have 233 of these in the plan with a budget of $48 million. Currently two are in the construction phase and that top photo is um, Basin 89, Scottsmore, Arantia Road. This is up in MIMS and this is, has a baffle box that's then gonna lead into this, the flow is gonna lead into this pond which will have BAM material before to treat the um, stormwater before going into the lagoon. And then the bottom photo is Satellite Beach Lori Lane Project that's also under construction. This is near Sherwood, Park Avenue, Lemon Street. And this is um, replacing the trunk line with a treatment and conveyance system for the stormwater there. We have how many? 11 projects are in the design phase. 36 projects are completed. And I have a few slides because I couldn't fit all of this in one. So here's page one, two. And then for three, we have nine uncontracted projects um, for stormwater right now. And I'm happy to share that the city of Melbourne recently completed their Grant Place Baffle Box project along Crane Creek. So they're just doing final closeout right now. So that's exciting. Now we have vegetation harvesting. We have nine projects in the plan for a total budget of 1.3 million. Um, Melbourne Tillman Water Control District is um, underway. This quarter they removed over 400,000 pounds of vegetation to, uh, with a TN reduction of 4,304 pounds. So overall the project um, is 39% complete. And they've been going for two quarters I believe and I've already removed over 600,000 pounds of vegetation and 6,000 pounds of total nitrogen. So this uh, photo here is from uh, Canal 14 Bombardier Avenue, I think. I'm probably butchering that street name, but you can really see the difference between the before and after there. Uh, Maritime Hammock uh, was also completed um, this quarter, and this is in Cocoa Beach, and this is their stormwater pond. And they removed 80, almost 83,000 pounds of vegetation and 143 pounds of total nitrogen. And then we have three projects that are in the design phase, um, and then four have been completed, and we have not yet contracted for Cocos North and South Lake Mont Ponds. Uh, for now, we're on to muck and interstitial treatment projects. We have 19 of these in the plan for $155 million. Um, two are actively under construction. That's Grand Canal that um, has removed 244,000 cubic yards of material and Sykes Creek has removed over 9,000 cubic yards of material. Um, and we have O'Galley Northeast is about to go into the um, bidding phase and will hopefully start construction uh, next year. The, we have quite a few in the design phase and at different stages of design and survey work going on for those. And then we have four that have been completed, um, Turkey Creek, Redredge, MIMS, um, Interstitial Treatment, and then two Cocoa Beach projects. And we have three that are not yet contracted, but um, work is about to start on those next year, at least initial field survey work. Oyster Bars, we have 25 projects in the plan um, for $9.8 million. Um, this quarter, the Brevard Zoo installed 1,900 square feet in their um, Central Indian River Lagoon 2 contract, and this photo is the coral corral walls that were installed there. Um, the rest, the others here are at, at different phases of um, completion. And then we have quite a few that are completed. What do we have? Eight that are completed, and then we have 11 that are not yet contracted. And then um, the Brevard Zoo also this quarter completed their Central Indian River Lagoon Oyster One project, and that had a total of 10,200 square feet um, installed. For planted shorelines, oh, my picture's crooked. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone rotate your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> there are 11 projects um, for planted shorelines for a budget of 
thousand dollars. Um, currently under construction, we have the McNabb project, which is this picture here. Um, they have they are currently constructing more of the planter boxes, and should be installing the remaining plants over the next few months. Um, with that, we have seven of these projects are completed and three are um, not yet contracted. And our last project type is clam aquaculture. We have a budget for 10 farmers um, for $60,000 total. We currently have three active farmers and looking for seven more. And this is one of our farmers here showing off some of his little clams. <laughs> And so for an overview of this past quarter, um, we are reducing total nitrogen by an additional 32,000 pounds per year, uh, 1,400 pounds of um, total phosphorus from last quarter. We have a few more contracts underway and six additional projects were completed this quarter. Any questions? Terry. Uh, uh, back to the uh, harvesting. Um, is it look, the like a big disparity, disparity between pounds of wet material and nitrogen. Why is that? The plants hold a lot of water, so that wet weight is including that water. I, yeah. No, I understand that. I, look at the look at the pounds nitrogen reduction between the two projects you showed us. There looks like a big difference in how much nitrogen is being reviewed per, per 100 pounds of wet material. So with the, these projects, the um, entities have to submit a lab report for the plant types that were harvested. So each plant type has a different amount of composition of nutrients inside of it. So they submit a lab report with the plant types that were harvested from that quarter. Well, so is there... So one of them looked like, I don't know, it was like a pound per hundred, I mean a pound of nitrogen per hundred pounds of material. The this, this second one is like a much lower number. Is that, does that indicate that we should be cultivating a different kind of nitrogen removal plant? There, there's a lot of variation in the types of, and how much nitrogen and phosphorus uh, different types of plants use. And there was a University of uh, Alabama study on different aquatic plants and you know which ones um, have the highest nutrient contents. So when we do, you know, some of our projects are the planted mats, um, where you plant little plants on the floating wetland islands and then harvest those and then replant baby plants to grow again. So for those projects, we actually target the species that um, absorb the highest nutrients. For these projects, we're just harvesting whatever weeds are clogging up the waterways. And so, you know, we, we don't have a lot of ability to control yeah. what, what is there. So we use those lab analyses to, to do, to estimate what the actual load reduction benefit was for each site. So we know there's an advantage to getting that that uh, dead foliage, even if it doesn't have high nitrogen content. Is there some advantage to trying to figure out, you know, is there another metric in addition to pounds of nitrogen removed if, in fact, what's in that canal is plants that are relatively inefficient in taking up nitrogen, but they're still going to contribute to pollution in the lagoon if they die and, you know, or worse yet, they get... Uh, sprayed with herbicides. So I'm just looking to see is there another metric or something that would add to it or is it just more work that you guys don't need? Um, you know, always happy to take suggestions, but the because the metric of the plan is nitrogen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're reporting the pounds of vegetation, so you see what the pounds, you know, the total amount of vegetation removed is. Lorraine, go ahead. This, this part of the story that isn't told here is the herbicides that would be used yeah. if you weren't mechanically removing it, right? And so that isn't really being calculated into the formula, right? Correct. Okay. Probably because we're just getting a poundage, not a square foot, which is 
the herbicides are probably more of a square foot as they would spray it. Volume. Volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, because that's uh, a big deal. Dr. Winter and then Laura Lee. And, yeah, I want to uh, point out that what Terry says is important. Uh, there are other benefits to this plan other than removing nitrogen. Although nitrogen is what we're uh, quantifying our success on, there are other, many other benefits. It, and I've asked in the past for people when they're writing the proposals to point out some of the other benefits. And I came up with a long list of things, but we can't quantify that for every single proposal. And so just recognize the fact that when you're removing nitrogen, you're helping out in other ways too. And just leave it at that. <laughs> Laura Lee? Mm -hmm. um, it might depend on how much nitrogen's going into the waterway too. So if you have a big long canal that doesn't have a lot of yards next to it, you're not gonna have as much nitrogen in those plants as you are if, if you have a stormwater pond in the middle of a neighborhood where everybody's fertilizing their yards and that, that's going in. I had a question about um, the, the piles of calerpa that are uh, on the shoreline west of Titusville. Would it be beneficial to, that stuff could be pulled off the beach really, really easily right now. Would that be something that would be beneficial to try to remove those big piles of grassalaria and calerpa? Yes, we have argued that multiple times as have private vendors and we have tried to get permits for removal. So privately, um, and I may need to phone a friend with Brandon on exactly what the rules are, but you know, privately you can rake your shoreline, that's fine. But if we want to use heavy equipment to do that more efficiently, then we need a permit. and there are concerns about bycatch in that material. And even though we argue that it's rotting and there's low DO and any critter that's in there is <coughs> likely to die soon regardless and you know we'll shake it, we'll try to avoid bycatch, uh, we have failed in being able to get projects permitted in the past. So these piles are sitting on dry land. I mean, this was pushed up by the waves and it's, it's sitting away from the water. So would we need a, a permit to use heavy equipment to use? I'm thinking that maybe the refuge, you know, volunteers. Could. Dry land can be harvested now. Okay. Do you want Yeah, so FWC regulates harvesting when it's in the water. Once it's on dry land, it can be picked up, though I don't know if there would be other regulations using heavy equipment. So, yeah, if you're using something in that zone, so that would have to be looked into. What about the massive amount of grassal area that's still out in the water that didn't get pushed up on dry land because there was so much already there? Can we use hand rakes and pull that out of the water? Uh, FWC regulates any harvesting of algae in the water, whether it's rotting or not, to one gallon per day per person with a fishing permit. You would have to have a fishing license and be able to, yeah. I'm sure it's accidental. They put it in case you pull it out. Virginia Zero, so it sounds like it's maybe a permit issue, but maybe also an education issue or, or a change, policy change? Yeah, we've uh, reached out to FWC regarding this. Uh, they will issue us an emergency permit if needed, if they determine that it's a large enough amount. Um, but we have to go through a per permitting process and let them know on an individual basis they won't do a blanket permit. Well, and, and my, my thinking was like, what if um, we tried to reach out maybe to KBB Keep of our beautiful or somebody to do a small permit attempt just to see how it goes and maybe even shake some of that calerpa out and see how many little critters come out. Um, I, I just feel that there's a way for us to kind of um, move, move the ball like we did with the septic tanks when we said, no, we can use BAM. Do you think there's any chance for us to do that? So there was a, a local vendor who wanted to do that and was actually... <laughs> Uh, partnered with somebody that was trying to use that algae to um, generate biofuel. 
And so he proposed harvesting algae out of the lagoon to the agencies. State and federal fish and wildlife people came. They had him do a pilot project where it was hand rakes and a shaker system, and they counted the bycatch, and they had divers in the water following behind <laughs> the boat, and no go. So, you know, the reason we know so many details is because we have asked and asked and pursued. So where we left off, they said, if there is a massive emergency, we will consider a specific area with specific equipment done a very specific way. The problem with that is by the time that emergency happens, you know, there's not time to go through the permitting process. It's rotted, it's done the damage, the fish have died before you can get the permit to do anything about it. So um, we agree with you. It makes all kinds of sense. We have not been able to get there and we can't get a permit in advance in anticipation of an event because we don't have the details of what that emergency event will be. Yeah. I think we had looked in even one instance, and by the time we got everything, you know, talked about and trying to get through the agency, the wind shifted and it was gone. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Even in a you know a, a dredged canal, very artificial system, we couldn't succeed fast enough. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's something to keep on our radar. We got enough coals in the or sticks in the fire, but. Uh, that would be a good one to tackle. Todd, did you have something? Oh, and just to Laura, okay. Laura, did you finish? Go ahead, Doris. Uh, just to comment on, so one, I still remain supportive of doing these vegetation harvestings and cleaning up, but are we doing anything in terms of requiring then continued maintenance after the fact? I, I just look at way down the road, and we've got certain solutions, whether it's our, um, you know, our oyster barriers or the stormwater uh, structures or the septic to sewer, any of the, they, they represent truly a shift that says we're, we're stopping contribution. And so here, more vegetation is going to grow because there's more nutrient contributions. And I think it's important that we think about the sustainability of the actions that we're doing, that we say, you know, what, what is the follow on? Because I really don't think we, it's the, the right structure for us to then say, okay, 10 years from now, we're going to be back paying for this again. And so any of the, t the approaches that we're using that are kind of a one-time thing, are we pairing those with some expectations of then that transition to maintenance of the maintaining entity? We did have some agencies that have put in floating vegetative islands after they've done the harvesting. So in effect, having a system in place that they can easily remove vegetation in the future and they would maintain those. We, we have a standard paragraph, a clause in our contract about ongoing maintenance and the harvesting program, we only fund these the initial time. We don't fund them over and over. So it's about letting the communities experience, you know, what it really takes to harvest, um, how beneficial it is, how long it lasts, you know, understand how they might structure that program. It's, it's about getting them started. Yeah, I, I'm good with that. I guess one of my recommendations would be rather than just a, you know, a paragraph about thinking about it is an expectation of that so that because you know we we have a long duration funding program there's always potential this gets extended to me that's one of the things that should factor into future funding commitments is that uh, these entities truly are uh, following up and transitioning into a sustainable operating mode. You know, I absolutely know, you know, support that piece that people have fallen behind. It, it hasn't been a priority, it hasn't been planned, whatever it is that they need that hand up to get started. But then somewhere we got to think about long term sustainability and get into that localized funding and, and localized maintenance and planning and all those things so that we don't just head straight back to where we were at. So just for me, that's the that's one of those pieces of creating that expectation of maintenance. And then it's for me, it's something that we ought to factor that into our evaluation of future funding is that they've that those entities are following up on those commitments. 
Lorraine. Ms. Laura Lee first. Hopefully they would figure out that they could, the money that they've been spending on um, using herbicides on the plants could be better off and have more benefits if they <clears throat> use that money to mechanically remove the plants instead of poisoning them. On the um, on this uh, permitting to remove the grassalaria along the shorelines, would, would that be something, could a legislator maybe try to get some legislation put in place for emergency removal of these, these nuisance um, vegetation that are killing the river following an emergency? Would, would that be something that could be done by the legislature? Well, I think it probably would be an agency or a policy shift or change. And so I think that's something that, you know, we could, I, I plan on working a little bit offline and see if we can get some movement on that, but I'm not sure there's anything we could do together. Well, it's just, it's just another example of where the permitting, I mean, look at, look at the nightmare that's going on further north of us with those homes that are teetering yeah. on the cliffs and they can't get <coughs> permits. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Larry? Yeah, well, I hate to take the conversation backward. I was just going to say, though, to Todd's point, um, having had experience with the uh, ponds and the floating wetlands, that it turned out they're very inexpensive. In fact, so inexpensive to maintain that it made sense to do that versus the herbicides. I mean, it, we were quite surprised by that. Um, and then I was going to ask on the mechanical harvesting, didn't we, one of the big projects, didn't we actually purchase or help to purchase the equipment? Mm -hmm. And so that's over, this, the project is actually over the lifetime of that equipment, right? Correct. So Because, I mean, that's the biggest obstacle to doing the mechanical harvesting is the expense of the equipment. And a few of these entities have used the funds to purchase equipment so they can continue mechanical harvesting instead of herbicide mm -hmm. use in the future. Okay. And then I just had yeah. one other question. Yeah. The, you said that the Merritt Island Utility Company requested removal. Mm -hmm. um, and why was that? There was a project. Yeah, that's a um, package plant up in North Merritt Island, and that is their business to run the package plant. So oh. if the, a privately owned one, so okay. if they connected to sewer, that's the end of their business. I see. Okay. <laughs> so who put the project in the plan? Okay. And then they, they just said no thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Winter and then Todd. Can I take you back to your overview slide, the very last one where you pointed out the 159,000 mm -hmm. pounds of total nitrogen? <laughs> last year around this time, you came in with a slide, and I think it was just under 100,000. So quick yeah. math in the head, 60,000 pounds in the last year, mm -hmm. it's about a 60% increase. 60, 60, not 16, 60% increase in nitrogen removal this year. I think that's outstanding. Thank you. I think you guys need to point that out every year, how much, you know, you've done. You, you do it, but unless people look at the number, I like numbers. <laughs> Lots of people don't. And so I like, thank you. Appreciate it. Todd. Uh, just to comment then on the package plan, are we looking at any follow-up on that, whether it's one validation of compliance with the new, some of the newer nutrient management rules that have been passed, but also... There's other ways to approach this as well. So, I mean, is there, is it worth any follow-up on that front? Do you have anything to say? I didn't talk to them. Did you, do you have anything to add? No. Will you come up and yeah. use the mic? <laughs> Sorry. So while, while Matt walks up here, we, we did talk to the agency um, about uh, ensuring that all these private um, systems are submitting all of the submittals that they're supposed to be submitting, and the department has reached out, and we are seeing better compliance in that regard. 
Yeah, without looking at the numbers on that specific one, I don't know that it would be worth it for us, uh, cost per pound, to connect them to a municipal one. But if it was worth bringing them to, you know, maybe down to AWT, we could look at the numbers and maybe present that to them, say, hey, would you guys want to upgrade the plant or anything like that to you know bring the treatment level down? Because they're not at AWT now, right? I I, I don't know without looking at okay. the numbers on that okay. one. I'd be surprised. Yeah, we but. we analyze the numbers all three ways. Okay. Do we upgrade the plant? Do we connect the plant to sewer? Do we upgrade the rib or the spray field? And what made the most sense for this facility by the numbers was trying to connect them to sewer. They're not interested in doing that because that would eliminate their business. So I think your point is, OK, so we lost option A. Should we go back and look at option B, option C, look at compliance? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know if you lost option A or not. So, for instance, okay. you're connecting to the sewer, that's fine, and the business says they don't want to connect to the sewer. That doesn't mean that, you know, you can acquire private utilities. The the the, lo the local government can push for acquiring, uh, you know, I've been involved in numerous acquisition of private utilities, and that it, you, it might take, it might just be different. Connecting them might not just be the physical act of connecting them. It may involve a business proposition that you acquire that private utility right as well. So I guess that's my point is that there's, you know, there's kind of com compliance validation as one strategy. There's acquisition opportunities. There's, there's numerous ways to put these things together. So my, my hope would be that if this is a significant contributor that's worth the time, that we at least look at what those other those other approaches are of pairing, um, you know, different aspects of solutions together before we just you know give up on it. And, and I don't know the numbers well enough to know if that makes sense or not. But just thank you, Todd. I just got educated there. Thank you. And then one more thing on your co the the question on the legislation. Rulemaking routinely happens through legislation. So the legislature can pretty much make any regulatory entity within the state do about whatever they want through, as long as it's compliant with federal law. And so there's always those options, but you need to be thoughtful about how that happens because it's, you know, it it's you generally don't want to piecemeal things. So if we're going to go legislative routes on things, I think it's prudent to kind of have the big picture of the different activity, the different things that you'd want to do so that you're really having it with the end in mind rather than just piecemealing everything that comes up because that's not going to go well. But legislative routes are, can be very um, uh, productive. They can prompt rulemaking by the, regula the regulatory entities. Um, and I think the legislature here in recent years has shown some appetite for um, doing environmentally oriented legislation and tying into rulemaking. So we're, we're candidly late uh, right now for this legislative session, but if it's something that they wanted to think about, then putting together that plan to target, you know, socializing it and talking to some of the, the, the local delegation to head toward next legislative session could very well be viable. Yeah, my thoughts, exactly. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? Stephanie, are you still there? Mm -hmm. It'll take her a okay. while to find the mute button. I know, the mute button, the unmute button, the mute button. Okay, I had uh, three things, but you got my one with the Merritt Islands. So that was good. The second one, um, so with the... I am still here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> so, you know, I should, I should know I'm used to waiting for the voice upstairs. So uh, no, no problem. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, Stephanie, just feel free to, to, to scream out, yell out. Well, I have this, I have the same question about uh, Merritt Island as well, but it, okay. it was answered. Yeah, that one was taken. All right, good. Um, I had uh, two more questions then on, so, well, one on mechanical harvesting. I know we keep going back to it because I think it's good. Do we have, um, as Dr. Winter suggested, I think trends are really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we looked how many pounds were done, and I know we only pay to do it the one time, but I think it still would be good to look at over the years how many pounds we're collecting, um, because I know everybody on this committee feels 
that vegetative harvesting is the way to go as opposed to herbicide. And I think that those numbers would, would show that rather than us just saying it. Um, and then also along those same questions, when we have the muck, we had muck maps showing like where's the best place to do muck. Do we have, can we take some of these data points that we know and look at ponds or stormwater ponds to see which ones may, um, may be a target rich environment for lack of a better term? Um, you know, whether they're gonna cut back on herbicide because of the volume or the length or, we won't know by vegetative species because we don't know that until we do a lab sample, right? Well, for the, for the most uh, frequent species, we, we can identify, you know, we know which ones are, um, have higher concentration of nutrients than others. And, you know, so if the pond is covered in um, water lettuce versus water hyacinth versus cattails or hydrilla, you know, we, we would have a sense of which ones would be more cost effective. Okay. I'm just thinking like the, you know, the, the, the seagrass tool that's being developed, if we had some sort of, you know, vegetative harvesting or stormwater tool that we could give even to municipalities so that they could see mm -hmm. where would be the best place to target if we were able to bring those data points. I don't know if we have them. Um, and then the third one um, was with the vegetative boxes, and I see Kelsey back there uh, from Cocoa Beach. And so I, I, I'd love for you guys to do a presentation on that at some point. Maybe, maybe you're not comfortable there, but I know Laura Lee talks so much about the hardening uh, walls, and I'd love to see something down the road on, on that project. Because a lot of people may be interested in, in having a box hanging off their, off their uh, uh, canal, off their seawall. So, okay, great. That's it, I'll shut up now. All right, Terry, thank you. Right, thank you. I think Logan's gonna do the videos next. Okay. So, I think. Um, <laughs> do we have, we have videos? Logan? Vegetation harvesting is a method we can use as an alternative to herbicide treatment. And it uses mechanical harvesters like the excavators or floating harvesters that can physically remove plant material that would otherwise cause flooding and also are harboring a lot of nutrients that we're trying to get out from getting into the lagoon. We've identified approximately 35 to 40 miles of canals that need to have vegetation removed. We're specifically down the southwest quadrant of the district, which is southwest Palm Bay. In total, Melbourne Tillman maintains over 163 miles of canals. For many decades in the past, we relied exclusively on herbicides to control vegetation in our ponds. And controlling the vegetation is important because that vegetation can trigger flooding concerns. So we viewed the vegetation exclusively as a problem that needed to be addressed. Now we view it as an opportunity. You're farming out the nutrients that are trapped in that vegetation. By harvesting it, we're removing the nutrients. And at the same time, you're removing a threat to flooding. We're 100 years old this year, so some of our equipment seems like it's been 100 years here, but this, this program's helping out us to get some funding to help purchase another long reach. So we'll have two, we'll keep this one and we'll have another one and we'll be able to actually get out there and, and clean these canals more frequently. The canals in areas like Palm Bay collect water and help control flooding in these areas, but they're also collecting all the nutrients that come from people's homes, like fertilizer and septic systems. So the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Plan is working to try to reduce some of these other nutrient inputs too, so it slows down the accumulation of the nutrients in these canals. So we're working to remove septic systems or upgrade them where we can't. We're also trying to educate homeowners on the proper use of fertilizer cutting out entirely. There's programs like the Lagoon Loyal program that people can learn simple things they can do around their home 
to help reduce their own nutrients. The University of Florida IFAS has recently started up a soil guardian program where people can test their soil and see if they even need fertilizer. So being able to cut fertilizer and other nutrients out at the source before they get into these canals is very important to the health of the Indian River Lagoon. All right, well done. Thank you. Any questions? Any more on mechanical harvesting? I think we, uh, we did a good job on that one today. All right, do we have another video? Brady? All right, and uh, so we also have our fertilizer PSAs. So we've been working on these for over a year now, I think. It's been a, a bit of a longer process on these than our project videos, but I think they turned out pretty good. Um, Logan, I don't know if you can turn the volume up a little. That one, that last one was a little low, so if you can make the next a little louder, that'd be great. One very simple action you can take for the health of the lagoon is knowing which type of fertilizer to use and which to avoid. Look for two key numbers, zero phosphorus and 50% slow release nitrogen. It's worth the extra look. Do your part to help prevent algal blooms and fish kills. Leave non-compliant fertilizer behind. Lagoonloyal.org. A healthy lagoon begins with all of us. Let's be clear. Heavy rains flush fertilizer off your grass and into the lagoon, which can cause algae blooms and lead to fish kills. Go fertilizer free June 1st through September 30th and never fertilize before forecasted rain. Lagoonloyal.org. A healthy lagoon begins with all of us. Let's be clear, fertilizer can cause algae growth and lead to fish kills in the lagoon. Never fertilize near water. Rain and irrigation can wash it into the lagoon. Lagoonloyal.org. A healthy lagoon begins with all of us. All right, that's it. All right, Todd, is that your voice there? It sounds like a little voiceover. No. So, uh, so where, where can we see those, or where we expect them to be? We will be putting them on our social media sites. Uh, we'll have them on our YouTube just for general use. People can do that. And then we're looking at putting them out under other avenues. So they're 30 seconds long, so we can put them on some of the possibly streaming platforms or other you know, media. Okay, yeah, that was going to be, I know we talked last month about some additional education stuff, and I would love to see that put in places where people don't expect it. I think that's, that's what we need to hit, because people that are going to our YouTube channel, they're already yeah. motivated. We need people that don't know they need to be motivated. Yeah, that's why um, we're looking at streaming on like Hulu and... Yeah, Hulu, like uh, yeah. YouTube TV, Fire TV, Roku, yeah. all the things, TikTok... So, so we made all, sure that they that all the things? were under the 30-second uh, guidelines that the TV stations also put out. So we can look into putting them out there, too, okay. as well. When we do put those out, if we do, can you let us, let us know yep. where and when to watch them? Yep. Right. And uh, speaking of YouTube, we do have a new YouTube URL. So YouTube put out handles now. And so we have our own personalized URL. <laughs> So when we were trying to get that 100 people so we could personalize our URL, as soon as we got the 100, they discontinued personalizing the URLs because they were rolling out this new system. So we appreciate getting to the 100, but uh, we uh, have now uh, youtube.com at Save Our Lagoon, or slash, you know, youtube.com slash at Save Our Lagoon. All one word, Save Our Lagoon? Yep. Great. And, and that's on the... The, the one pager uh, progress report under the website, social media, newsletter, and report links. Yeah, the link's written on there. So, and then it'll link to that in the future. So okay. The old link still works, but. Uh, the new one's better. The new one's better. Yeah. Okay, great job on the commercial. I think that that's going to turn some heads. Um, all right. 
Anyone else have any other questions or comments on the commercial? If not, we're going to take an eight minute break um, before we dive into the uh, project requests. All right, we'll be back in eight minutes.
All right, once Virginia comes back, we'll start here. You're good. No, no rush, Virginia. No rush. We did. We we're still 30 seconds short of eight minutes, so we're good. I know. I know. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, get started, Logan. Whenever you're ready, just uh, let me know when we're back. We're back. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Here we go, uh, Virginia. Okay. Um, before Terry runs you through the project list, I wanted to give you an idea of where you sit financially. So uh, you saw this graph a little uh, few minutes back with, with Crystal. What I did was try to project uh, what we expect to collect for the month of September. Um, in September, we, we get two revenues. We get the quarterly disbursement plus the month of September. So as Crystal said, the quarterly just arrived yesterday afternoon. And then um, I used a 9% growth for September 22 over September 21 to estimate what I think uh, our revenues. I tried to do a conservative estimate. So, you know, we know that um, inflation has been up over 8% um, in September, and our revenues have grown stronger than, you know, faster at a higher rate than uh, the CPI. So um, using the actual quarterly plus a 9% growth projection for the monthly, uh, I am projecting that we will collect at least um, a total of 291 million for this year. And you can see that that star is considerably above the blue line of projections. And so that difference, the delta, it would be 7.7 .7 million in unanticipated revenue collections. Okay. Everybody understand? Dan, any questions about that before I go to the next one? Okay. Do we know, so, Virginia, I'm sorry, real quick. Do, I, and I don't, I can't do the math in my head. Maybe, Crystal, you can. Do we know what percentage that $7 million is over it? I did not do that calculation okay. for the year. Um, maybe Crystal can crank that out. Well. Just because, obviously, if, if inflation has gone up, if it's 9% more costly, and then we're yeah. at nine percent. I, I mean, think it's um, four, we were at eight. We were at eighteen percent growth over last year, um, but of course we anticipated some of that growth. Yes. So I think we were at like fourteen. Anyway, we'll we'll let Crystal see if give she us can. the unofficial official count. Yes. Um. So then uh, in all those uh, completed projects that Terry just ran through, there were several of them that were completed under budget. And so we didn't actually spend everything that was allocated in the plan. Some of those were in project types where the money like for um, quick connects um, and the smoke testing, those uh, excess dollars are going to roll into the leaky lateral repairs and more quick connects of, of septic to sewer. But for these projects, they're done. Um, the, these dollars roll back into the pot. And so this is an additional 55000 to reallocate. And then you know we have a 5% contingency in the plan for all of the projects. So these are the list of projects that were completed in this year and did not use uh, contingency. And so this is half a million dollars that's available. The yellow highlighted line, the Maritime Hammock Preserve, uh, while they have not uh, used a contingency or had contingency approved already, they are the last item on your agenda um, requesting about $6,800 of contingency. So I just you know, wanted to, to highlight that that's a, I, I couldn't, I didn't know 
how uh, the committee was going to vote, so I included it on the list as is right now, but that may change by the end of the meeting. All right, so, so we have surplus revenues uh, collections plus savings plus contingency. You add that all together and you get $8.3 million. Um, then we have the Merritt Island Utility Company package plant connection where they said they were not interested. Um, so that $1.3 million um, is available unless you uh, want to keep that funding there and have us uh, work, work harder at, at trying to get them um, interested in, in converting. Um, and then for the quick connects, you know, we did an analysis of where there were septic systems near existing sewer lines that had not connected. That's a fixed number of parcels, fixed number of locations. And so when we are able to get a grant for that program, um, that covers the cost, some of the cost for those connections. So we don't need to just expand the pot for that program. We can reduce the Save Our Lagoon funds dedicated to that program. So um, you could take 585 of 85,000 of Lagoon funds uh, out and reallocate that. Then um, last at the last meeting, the committee recommended expansion of the outreach program, so doubling the three existing campaigns, adding two more campaigns, and then adding uh, $6,000 to boost um, and encourage people. The half cent sales tax is doing this. You can help by doing this complimentary action, um, pairing those sorts of messages. We. And, and the direction, we, we reread the, the minutes, listened to the video a few times, right? The direction, I believe, was $6,000 for a year, test it, see how it does. Um, we went ahead and put the 6000 in for the five remaining years of the plan. You can obviously remove that now or remove it later, but we thought that was um, a clearer way to do it. So if you subtract that uh, 1.1 million from all these other uh, available dollars, that leaves 9.1 million to go towards projects in this list of, of proposals. Any questions about these numbers before we go to the? I, I, I think they're great. Um, first off, I think the grants that we've got, our legislators, whoever helped us get that, that's amazing. We always talked about leveraging our funds to get additional funds at the state level. So uh, half a million dollars for that is, is awesome. We can put back. Um, and then, of course, the contingencies. I love it that projects are coming in um, not using their contingency, um, showing other municipalities are, are trying to save money, um, some which are here. So that's very appreciated because every dollar we, we try to stretch it as far as we can. So I, I think it's great in the fifth year to have $9 million additional for sixth year to uh, to put back in. And the municipalities are also pursuing grants, and yeah. so they're helping to make that delta in inflationary project costs. Um, they're, they're making that up with, with grants, and, and so, yeah, we've done real well on few contingency requests. Yeah. Okay, so with that, I'll hand it over to Terry to go through the project list. So I'm going to go over this no. first. Okay, so Jackie printed out the project list on a one-page sheet. It fits a little easier so you don't have to flip, um, but it's up to you on how you would like to view it. Um, so I'm going to go through the project list, and I know a lot of the applicants are here today, um, so they might be able to answer any questions that you may have. So um, the List is organized by project number, project name, entity, project type, and then we go into our TN reduction, what they're eligible for, their maximum eligible cost share, what the total cost of the project is, total cost, um, dollar per pound of total nitrogen removal, and then what their eligible cost share uh, is. 
and then their, what it is cumulatively. And I have the, I'll do this in Excel later and we can work out um, everything. And then in the notes column, I did a real quick synopsis of what the project is. And on the short forms, there's a little more detail in there. So the first project, they're organized by. Uh, Sherry, hold on one second. Lorraine. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Because it's a little confusing going through. Um, microphone. Oh, microphone. microphone. <clears throat> um, sorry. Just uh, to remind me and, and maybe other people in the audience, the meaning of eligible cost share um, as compared to, because it was a little confusing when I looked at total cost and then you've got eligible cost share okay. and then you've got maximum eligible could you just explain those sure. a little bit? Um, so the total, the first one, first number, total nitrogen reduction pounds per year is what the um, applicant estimates the total project to be. The eligible cost share rate is what the maximum amount al is allowed in the plan. So each project type has a cost share rate. So vegetation harvesting is $110 per pound. Muck removal is $520 per pound. Uh, stormwater projects vary by location um, between $313, um, $446 per pound, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the next column is the maximum. So that is the, for instance, the first one, 5,385 times the 110 gives you the maximum that they're eligible for. And then some costs, project costs, are more or less than that. So that's the total project costs in the following column. Mm -hmm. And then the total cost dollar per pound is what it actually is for removal. So these first one, two, three, five are less than what the eligible cost share rate is. So that's why they're highlighted. I know it's really hard to see in the printed version, but they're in green, a very light green. And so then... Sorrel will not pay over actual cost. So if the if they were eligible for more than the actual total cost, that's what the next column is, what they their request would be. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so these first five are um, have a lower total cost dollar per pound than what is eligible for in the plan. And then as we move down the list, these next few green ones are um, the maximum. And then they go, so you can see the eligible for instance, this uh, riverfront is $313 per pound, but it um, then goes jumps up to $608 per pound. So we rank them by their eligible cost share rate here. And then towards the bottom, we have um, two new project types that we, um, for Cocoa Beach for a turf field, and then the North Banana Three Bridges for um, an aeration uh, and circulation biodredge project. So are there any questions there? Anybody have questions on that? Okay. Okay, so I can move over to the Excel version and we can start um, playing with our numbers and going that route okay so let's so let's do this so now that we've got um, all the projects in front of us Virginia gave us the one form with some of the available funds for reallocation um, what I'd like to do first off uh, I did have uh, Clint contacted me or we talked this morning about a change on his project um, and so I, I told him I'd let him speak briefly just on the change on his project and then let's go ahead and go into uh, talking about what we want to do going forward. Does that does that work with everybody? Okay, okay Clint. If you, it's the uh, last one, the North Banana River Three Bridges. So, Clint, did you want to talk about the change that you had you mentioned this morning? Oh yeah, thank you, Vinny. I'm trying to get a project going where we can kind of take back some of our canals. As we know, everybody is concentrating so much on the river and the nitrogen levels and everything else. And what I'm trying to get into is maintaining what we have and letting it start to heal itself. With, and basically that's through aeration and circulation. Also, the plan that I had put in was kind of big. 
and it was more money than I think that the county would like to put out at this time on this type of a project. Because I don't have numbers for nitrogen, I don't have numbers for TP, I don't have any of this stuff. But what I do have is a simple plan to come in to a system that is basically sealed. When you're going down the North Banana River, you got the three bridges, or two bridges you go over, and you have canal systems there that are totally isolated. And the only flow they have is from the Banana River. And it's a limited, I mean, it's wind, whatever we get pushed up in there, which is very little. And the system I'm looking at is what I call B Canal. It is just north of Harbor Drive. First bridge you come to if you're going north on North Banana River. It goes back in and it splits off into several other canals, also goes back into a large mangrove area. And what my idea is, is come in with aeration, circulation, and with what we call biodredging. Once you get the oxygen levels up, we can put in SMR pellets, which we can get the good bacteria going and thriving and doing its job. And we can remove about two months, two inches a month of the muck that's in there. Unlike a dredge, a dredge comes in and cuts through the middle, just cuts out what it can get to. And when we got the, the right bacteria, we got the good oxygen levels, we can come in and we're taking out that two inches throughout the whole system from wall to wall on these canals. And we're taking it out through the whole water column. So that'll help clean things up. Circulation's gonna slow down all this algae we got because the algae doesn't like that moving water that much. But we have the aeration that is also putting the oxygen level back up and maintaining it day and night so that we can get our bacteria to work. Also to come in with my uh, habitats, we can also come in with a little bit of salt mitigation. We can bring the levels of the salinity back up to where it's supposed to be in our canal systems so that we can have the fish back in there. We're losing all of these mangrove areas that are hatcheries, nurseries, and everything else in these canals because the only water they have coming in is from the streets and from the houses. And the salinity levels are so low that we're actually killing out our mangroves. And if you look on Google Earth or anywhere else where you can see those mangroves in those areas, the colors are so much different from our mangroves that are out in the river towards Cocoa Beach and whatnot. We're losing these mangroves, so we're losing our nurseries. Plus the fact that, like, the storm we just had. Sorry. It's all right. The storm that we just had, a lot of the uh, oyster projects that are going on, the storms we just had just beat them to death on the river. You know, I don't know how many of them are still there or how bad they were affected. But in these closed areas, like this canal system I'm talking about, we're protected from that. So if we can get the oxygen levels up, get the salinity where it's supposed to be, about the same as the river, we're saving the canal, we're saving the fish, we're saving our nurseries. It's just so many benefits. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, Clint. All right. Could I ask a quick question of Terry or, or Virginia, one or the other? Um, uh, if I understand correctly, we have about $9 million roughly. And if we picked, like if we really wanted to fund one project, like the Muck project that is $12 million, that would wipe out everything else, plus we'd have to come up with $3 million someplace else, right? And so as we're going through this list, we really need to be thinking about what we need to cut out. Uh, uh, unless we come up with something else, we're gonna bump off of our original list of projects. Am I, inter am I interpreting everything correctly so far? Yes, you are. Thank you very much. Yeah, let me just summarize. Um, you have $24.9 million, uh, well, plus, plus the three bridges, so 20, over $26 million worth of requests, and you have $9.1 million available. Okay, Courtney. I just had a couple quick questions on the, on the projects themselves. Is this the time that we're supposed to be doing that? Yeah, okay. yeah, this is, it. This, <laughs> um, is, this is the time. This is the time, okay. For the, the Sunnyland Canal muck removal project, the Homeowners Association, will they be actually conducting that project or will Brevard County be hand-holding that project? Yeah, currently the proposal is that they would do it. If there were funding for the Mullet Creek Islands project that the county would be doing, mm -hmm. then uh, you know there would be more flexibility for 
collaboration, but um, if it's just the Sunny Land project that's approved, then it would be Sunny okay. Land. Um, okay. Let me, let me condition that. So the county does have uh, programs for um, big uh, infrastructure type projects where we can set up a financing system, a 10 or 20 year financing system, and the county can do the work and then tax the folks to pay back their share. Mm -hmm. um, that approval process obviously hasn't been discussed yet, okay. but that, that is a, an option to consider. So what would be their match on this project? It's about $5 million, because our estimates are it's a $10 million project, and they're eligible for 5.2 of SORL funds. Mm -hmm. So that would just be my only question would be, you know, where is that match coming from? Is that, you know, feasible to do? Um, the other item... Yeah, we could add grants to that, too, as match. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but... For, for like the county to do that, or city, the government that does these things every day, that's not that big of a hill to climb. But when a, a homeowner association is doing that, that's what I'm just asking, like how much help are they gonna have from the county to, to help them go through that process? Just, you know. Yeah, we, we assist um, private entities with grants and act as a pass-through agency. So okay. for instance, the Oak Point Mobile Home Park, yeah. um, we have a $350,000 grant with St. John's to assist with that project, and Perfect. we wrote it and are managing that for okay. them. Because I have to say, I'm ha happy to see this on here. I just have to say, that, you know, they, they work really hard, you know, to, to help the lagoon, and I think it's great that they're putting, you know, putting their putting all their efforts into stuff like this. So, um, But I, I just think from my personal opinion in um, the Mullet Creek, I would love to see it get done, but it, you know, we don't have the funding unless we look at our plan and see if there's something else we want to cut out. Um, but look, just going off this list today, I think, I think I would like to see us concentrate on the bigger bang for our buck, if you will, on the projects like <clears throat> the vegetative harvesting, I think it's critical that we do the South Brevard water reclamation facility upgrades. Um, and, the, and the reason why is, um, you know, that has such an impact further down the line. You know, it's a, it's a big, those are big projects. A package plant connection, that, that kind of falls in line with what the county commission's direction was in looking at, you know, septic to sewer and, and getting those things done. Um, I know if we did those projects together with the sunny land muck removal, then we would still have some money left to do some of the septic to sewer, but not all of them. So we might want to look at the, the, the parks and recreation septic to sewers that are, um, you know, a little bit large, the, the larger ones. Um, but th that would be my preference is to focus on the bigger bang for your buck, which would include muck removal, vegetative harvesting, the wastewater upgrades, the package plant connection, and then whatever septic to sewers that are left in the list that we can fund to fund. That would be my preference. Okay, I know Terry had a, a Terry and Todd, and, and also we, 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 these are additional applications. There may be um, stormwater projects that are in the plan that are not as much bang for our buck as Courtney mentioned. So we could also look, I think Terry, I don't know if you have some of those um, that we could look to replace um, and get additional funds. So, for instance, with the stormwater projects, I mentioned that we have 233 projects in the plan, and that includes a lot of basin projects. So we could look at the plan for, for instance, for the Cocoa Beach Gulf um, stormwater harvesting project and remove the lowest ranking Banana River stormwater projects from the plan and replace it with this. Which I think are, are, are more cost per pound mm -hmm. than, than this one here. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Because this, this one comes out at $28 per pound. Right. Mm -hmm. So we would have to substitute this project for the three most expensive uh, stormwater projects that are in that banana basin. And the 
cost share in the plan for those three projects ranged from 298 to $305 per pound. So it's an order of magnitude Huge less. savings right. per pound. What were those projects? Um, they were basins, uh, so and basin, I basin didn't a, jot a. down the basin numbers, but nobody has made any efforts to try to, you know, verify what the flows are in those basins yet or any preliminary okay. design. Not a penny has been spent on those yet. Okay. Okay, so Ter we'll, do ter we'll get back to that. Terry, did you have a... Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to follow the bouncing ball. Four of the first <laughs> five uh, projects, uh, four of them have different numbers than were on the sheets that were put out. What, uh, What's you know, like the different? first one, uh, the, f the very first one, 2008, came out on the sheet as uh, eligible cost share was 2,000,000, 2.3. Right. This is 592. Oh, be, I, uh, I see that now. Um, this Because they're not going to get more than their, uh, sorry, that should be 2 million. I don't know how that got switched there. This, this is a project expansion. Oh, correct, correct, yeah. Sorry, because this is an already approved project for $216,000. That's also why the number's a little bit off and jumps from 208 to 228. This project was approved last year in the plan update. And yeah, Cocoa Beach a, requested um, to revise their numbers based off of their maritime hammock project completion and the numbers they uh, received from the lab for that project. So what they're asking for is 376200 with this particular project? Correct. On top of the five, fun, right. 216 that they were already approved for. So right. for a total of 592350 Okay. But, but today we would be approving an additional 376000 Correct. Okay. So then, so then the third one, two, know, 229, know, but the, the muck thing came out on the sheet as two, what did it say the share was? Uh, the 20, maximum like, cost share like is 20, 28 million? Yeah. And then they were, but their total cost was 12.8, so that's why the 12.8 is used in the, this column here. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I agree with what Courtney was saying about prioritizing the projects. Um, I was looking at the similar one where she mentioned. Oh, micro is your mic on? The light lit? Okay. It was on, yes. And um, my other question, um, what Dr. Windsor had said about the funding, we got $9.1 million approximately. Is there any partial funding, for example, um, like the Mullet Creek, you know, that's $12 million. If we, we partially fund that, then we do Cocoa Beach harvesting and a couple other ones is that a possibility so I mean last year we did do some funding for engineering so I think anything you know if the motion passes here then that's what we'll present to the County Commission oh Virginia yeah, just um, there was um, mention of you know looking at what other muck projects were in the plan that you might want to substitute the only um, muck so there were a number of muck projects in the Central Indian River Lagoon where, where this proposed project is in that basin, the Central Basin, uh, in the original plan. But when muck money was reduced and more was uh, assigned to sewage, um, all the remaining projects in the Central IRL were unfunded. Only the Turkey Creek project that was already underway was left. So there, there there is no other muck project in the Central Lagoon where you could do a swap. Um, there is a, you know, in terms of ranking of muck projects overall, uh, the Rockledge A project is a, a there's a little over $5 million allocated for that project. Uh, the, the Sunny Land proposal is cost competitive with that Rock Ledge A, but that would be taking a benefit away from the North IRL mm -hmm. um, to assign it to the Central Lagoon. And the North IRL has still got, you know, a lot of blooms and a lot of muck. And um, there wasn't an obvious way of how to how to offset that five million dollar un you know disbalance. We work hard to try to 
improve the water quality in all three basins fairly evenly, you know, rise all the ships together. And so um, doing a, a muck substitution would, would offset that balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ups, upset the balance. Okay. So, I'm sorry, Todd. Todd, yes. And just, then just an observation, if, <laughs> if, um, if you exclude the Mullet Creek and then being that this, um, the Cocoa Beach is actually not the 592, it's only the, the 376, you know, we're only $573,000 short of being able to fund everything other than Mullet Creek. Um, just two observations, you've only got two projects on here that really don't include matching funding from the entity, which are the first two. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity to basically fund everything, but perhaps short fund those first two with some expectation of at least some level of matching contributions. You've always can go pursue additional grants and things, but I think you can get, I think we can get pretty close to funding everything other than that really large muck project, uh, with, with a little bit of just targeted short funding and things, uh, uh of that nature, so. Well, in Virginia, if we swap those stormwater ones, the basin ones, how much more additional does that net us? Um, because we're taking, or how much would we be taking out of the project plan with those stormwater basin ones that were more expensive per pound? Wrote that it was it was very close swap. So the for the first line. The three hundred and seventy-six thousand two hundred. Yes. Um, the the three lowest ranked projects in that same basin totaled. It was right around three hundred and eighty thousand. It was. So if we pulled those out, then that one we could put in without any additional cost. Correct. So Todd, that that one that we talked about, we could pull those three projects out that were more expensive and put that Cocoa Beach one in. And. Yeah, and pretty much get there. I mean, so I, 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 you know, that doesn't preclude this any discussion of merits other projects. But from if if the other projects are meritorious, then I think from a practical standpoint, there's a relatively easy path forward. So Terry is trying to capture what you're saying and <laughs> show it in uh, the cumulative cost column, so you can see. Um, I yeah, think I missed well, a I, little bit of the thing I think while the, doing the formulas. <laughs> so basically taking out the Mullet Creek. I did that. Okay. And then and doing well, a substitution Mullet Creek and the, the, the Mullet Creek run. interstitial treatment because you don't need to do right. So this would two. be zero. Then. So once yeah. you delete those two, then the numbers change pretty drastically. And then delete drastically. Cocoa Beach because we're going to replace stormwater with that. Yeah. Okay. This Cocoa Beach. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Okay. And then... That should, so that, you should, that should get you there. Okay. Scroll down. What is the total now? So. That gets us so, to here. So one thing, yep. Go. And then Dr. Windsor has a comment. Once we make sure our math and our Excel yes. skills are good, right. are we good on the Excel? Okay, go ahead. Dr. Yeah, Windsor. before trying to get to an effort of trying to fund all the rest, I think there's a couple that I'm willing to suggest we remove from the list now mm -hmm. to make it easier. And uh, I, I would suggest to you that the... Uh, the aeration study and the Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High School turf grass study, I don't think either one of those should be funded by the program. I don't think turf grass, I mean, I mean, yeah, I don't think turf grass has a, has a benefit to the lagoon. I, the idea of suggesting that you don't need to use nitrogen fertilizer is a reason why we should pay for turf, turf grass. It's not any good. I, I appreciate staff providing the IFAS document that had the nine points of the Florida friendly landscaping with uh, turf grass, and I think that uh, and anyway, it, the, the turf grass is not a good investment. And the aeration, we, we've had a number of presentations over the last few years. Uh, aeration is not going to be a solution to the problem. It, it, at best, a very short-term mitigation, a little bit to help uh, you know life uh, and near the aeration spots. Um, so I don't think either one of those two projects need to be considered any further, but that's just a recommendation on my part. Um, and then we can start talking about eliminating the big project, the, the muck dredging at, at Mullet Creek. I'm not going to defend muck dredging at Mullet Creek. Uh, it was in the original plan, I think, uh, maybe, but uh, I, don't, I don't even recall that. 
It but was. we're seeing most of the problems occurring recently and in, in the last few years in the northern end of the lagoon. Mullet Creek in the south end of the lagoon is, is probably not the best use of resources at this point in time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm okay with removing that too. So if we can remove some things, it makes it easier then for redistribution of the remaining funds to any other projects that are worthy of funding. Okay, Todd and then Lorraine and then Susan. And I'm, then I'm messing the aeration one, but, from, but, I, agree, but I agree on it. The last it's the very last one. Gotcha. But I agree on aeration in general. I, th I don't think it has a, a, it's a deployable long enough term technology that it's likely. So I don't have a major issue with that one. I disagree on the, the turf replacement. I, I, I look at it as that ultimately we're looking to reduce nitrogen contributions. And so going all the way to the to the source of nitrogen contributions as opposed to trying to remove it in treatment systems and things like that is is I think reasonable and when you're talking about a, a public entity and, and also connecting with the community and kids I think it has significant marketing potential and things of that nature so I have a little different view on it in that I just I think that it is something that is part of you know, athletics and kids and, and those types of things are a key part of our community as well. And so, you know, making that shift to complete source removal, um, I think has, has merit. So I, I appreciate the aeration removal, but and on the other one, I just have a little different view on that. Lorraine, and then Susan? Yeah, I would have to say that I uh, agree with Dr. Windsor. Um, I'm really concerned about microplastics and we know that all of the autopsies that have been done on dolphins in recent years, they include ingestion of microplastics. We know that's a real issue even in the lagoon. And when you have turf grass that I guess the worms are digesting, the birds are digesting them, um, you know, the problem um, becomes bigger. And I hope that's not the only way to reduce the fertilizers that we're using on, on turf grass. I hope we can find something better than that because if that's our only solution, we've got a lot of fields in this area, a lot of athletic fields that would quickly go to turf grass or go to this um, um, synthetic turf grass and it could become a really big problem before, you know, we know it, so I would really be against uh, the turf field project. Susan? Not to try to be a broken record, I agree with Dr. Windsor and Lorraine about the AstroTurf, um, about the plastics, um, and then also the schools, they just passed the millage, and then they also have the half cents um, sales tax. So. I think in the future, if we want to tell the taxpayers that we're doing what we are with the lagoon, we got to focus on the lagoon on what's proven, you know, the septic to sewer, the muck removal, the vegetation harvesting. So I think in order to proceed, I like the elimination of the last two projects that Dr. Windsor mentioned, and I'm not sure if I can make a motion on that so we could discuss the other bigger projects. Sure. You'd like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to eliminate the last two projects, uh, 243 and 244. That way we could proceed to talk about the other projects, the muck removal, the vegetation harvesting. I'll, I'll second. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to talk real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but now it's time for our discussion. I, I just wanted to, you know, I, I understand why schools want to do the turf grass. It's a lot easier for maintenance. I suspect that's probably the biggest reason for the request. Um, and it does, we do use a lot of fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides on fields. I mean, that's a fact. And even in my city, we've gotten away from a lot of that, those chemicals on other facilities, but we cannot stop using those on fields because they're used too much. You have to use them. So I understand that aspect of it. But what my biggest concern about this application is, and I'm just trying to kind of shoot this to any other schools that are wanting to apply later, um, is we have a lot of schools and they're all near the river. So, um, you know, I'm just waiting for the onslaught of applications for this type of thing. 
Um, the second concern is it's a million dollar project, so where's the other funding coming from? And, and if that's the district, um, you know, I just know from experience of working with the district is that they, they really look from an equitable standpoint of how they're going to distribute improvements like this and, um, you know, what would make Coco Junior Senior High School better than any other school requesting the same thing. So that's my biggest concern is whether they can actually pull the project off or not, as well as the fact that we're going to get, it will just open the floodgates to other applicants for this type of, of um, project. So I do agree with all the rest of you, and, I, and I'm just, um, I want to encourage applicants to stick with the typical plans, um, projects that we have in our plan, because that is how our plan has been structured, and it's very difficult to move from that, because that's what the voters voted on, and that's how, we, how our plan is structured. So um, that's the only comment I wanted to make. I'd like to add, Virginia, maybe over the next year, if we could add to our topics of presentations, maybe if we could have somebody come in mm -hmm. to talk about um, turf grass. I, I don't know what's out there scientifically, other than the IFIS report, but not only would that allow us to get educated, that would allow the public, maybe some additional education and some other options that they can use. Um, so maybe if we add that to the list of future presentations, Todd, do you think that would at least have a discussion on that? No, uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I respect all the, the varied viewpoints, and I think there's always, you know, that's why we have the committee to have those yeah. discussions. So, um, you know, I do, I, I, I'm not quite as firmly entrenched on projects that are in the exact four categories, because we, we have deviated from those. We've brought in new technologies and other things like that. So, uh, to me, you know, I, we should not discourage uh, creativity and stepping outside of some traditional bounds. So that part I don't agree with. Um, but you know the other concerns are all perspective and that's why we have discussion here and have the committee. So I, I don't feel so strongly about it that it's one that you know if the committee's feelings are very strong that I think we need to push tremendously farther. I understand some of the the concerns that Courtney brought forward. Um, so I don't feel strongly about it but again that's why we don't have single individuals making these decisions so I, I do I, I think a lot from the marketing and the connectivity side to people because one of the things we've always we struggle with is to continue to get that connection um, but again there's a lot of other valid and points that were brought up so yeah. I, I don't feel strongly about it um, you know in terms of that we got to push this mm -hmm. so it's uh, but I have my perspective, and and the the committee shows theirs, and that's pretty clear where that's landing. So I, I don't feel compelled to push it. Okay, but yeah. So Virginia, if we could get that uh, presentation, and then yes. Courtney, to your point, maybe and, and and Todd, I agree with you. I think thinking outside the box and creativity is mm -hmm. great. Um, maybe maybe if the uh, Bavard Public Schools came mm -hmm. with a presentation, I'm not saying it would pass by any chance, but something that would show some sort of you know, system-wide use of, of turf grass or something might be. That, and I think that's the, that's the point, you know, is when they make these types of improvements, either parents raise the money, and that's a, that's a big hill to climb with that yeah. funding, um, or, they, you know, or the district pays for it, and that's really the only funding sources they have. So to come up with that amount of money, I mean, nine, over $900,000 is, to me, is, is a long shot. Um, and I think unless the district has already given approval to fund that, um, I don't, you know, I think we're going to be setting aside $112,392 that we'll never see spent. So that's a concern. I, I think that, that's just a, a question in general for me, me then. We, I've heard that comment several times on these projects of questions about how the matching funds are coming forward. So when we do our application process, are we doing some validation that the the specific plans for any of the the self-funded component are there cuz you know for me if if there's a lot of uncertainty there that's something we need to work into our process before they're coming here that we're not approving a bunch yeah. of things that there's not a funding strategy already in place for the the matching component that um, that that's going to have to come forward. That is a question on the application. It um, asks requested and secured funding sources and okay. the source of those, and that information is found on the short form for each of the applications. So I know this um, application cycle, we did not have very many 
matching funding sources. I think one project had one. Okay, so we're yeah. collecting that. Uh, mm -hmm. and may, So maybe just when, when we come back through this again, I, I know you don't want to get into the detail, but you know, m maybe something that just says whether the matching funding is already secured or not. That way it's clear that we know if we're dealing with kind of a, a pie-in-the-sky request or a real plan. I mean, is anybody from the school here? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I see can, Would maybe you, you like can... to come up? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> How you doing? Cole Manis, assistant principal at Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High School. Uh, and we have a few, a, a lot of irons in the fire right now. We're trying to go and make a green push, and this was part of that push. Um, so we are looking, we're getting a, a CTE, Career and Technical Education Program, uh, that revolves around aqua science. And a big part of that is we're getting an aqua lab, hopefully for next school year. We're looking at getting an outdoor classroom. We're right uh, on the Indian River Lagoon, and this would be sandwiched between those two things. So on top, the, the initial initiative on this was to uh, remove all of the fertilizer and pesticides. So we looked at how much we were putting on, and if we were to go to turf, it would remove that. Now with the turf, we were looking at doing um, an organic material that was made of cork and uh, I forgot the other one, but cork infill, and it was an organic process instead of the rubber crumb infill. So that was supposed to uh, address any concerns about the leaching. Um, when we started looking at it more, we actually have about, a, I think it's a 76,000 square foot area by the stadium where the turf would be going because we have an interlocal agreement with Cocoa Beach, uh, the city of Cocoa Beach, where we have four baseball and softball fields, and we have practice fields. So the idea was... Uh, there was an article on the agenda that was very informative. It's going to help me with some of the xeriscaping and things we do in the future um, in regard to turf. But on this one, um, once we realized we had all these other fields in play and we had this area to work with, we were talking about, uh, I was talking with um, Ms. Brusso from Ferguson, where we could start incorporating bold and gold, BAM walls, potential R tanks where the drainage pipes would go and take care of all the fields in that area. Now, that realization came across after we put in the request for the turf field. We realized we had some potential to do more than just a turf field. But the impetus of this was to remove all the yearly applications of fertilizer and pesticide. And to your point, I would need board approval to get more of that going, and that is not been agreed upon yet okay. so I would need that okay thank you mm -hmm. anyone have any questions on this project Susan please I just had a question for maintenance on the project um, like if you were to get funding from the board us and the school board would there be maintenance on the project because we were talking earlier if we say okay here's the money mm -hmm. is it going to be maintained because mm -hmm. I'm not sure how long turf grass lasts is it uh, it's about years? a uh, they say up to 20, but I think more realistically it would be about the 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the maintenance that you have it. Um, we do have well, maintenance on staff. That's part of the, what I'm in charge of, is the maintenance of it. Um, right now we just had a rubberized track, and I, my enemy list is this long mm -hmm. from me hollering at people to make yes. sure everything is taken care of, you know, as far as that goes. I know that's not a concrete plan, but just to let you know, yes, there is maintenance involved, and yes, we would be on top of that. We have athletic director, custodial staff, um, the district help. A lot of the, the bright side of this would be instead of them coming to that football field, they could go to other areas and stay on top of other uh, locations because we would be able to maintain it a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Terry? I just get clarification of terms. I've heard turf, turf grass, and artificial turf, and people are using them almost interchangeably. You are talking about putting artificial turf mm -hmm. down on Yes, sir. Thank An you. organic infill, artificial turf. And, and turf, so not grass, the rubber. turf grass is something else, right? Yes, that is, yes. That's organic. That's, that's, that's just grass. It's natural yeah. grass. Mm -hmm. It's just not St. Augustine. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm promoting that in my yard. It's all clover. <laughs> <laughs> no, this would be the artificial turf. Thank you. Yep. Lucky clover. Okay. Um, anyone else have any other questions? Just that... It, just that it is... So it's... You have the organic material that it is attached to, but it's synthetic grass, right? Just to clarify. You're saying currently? No. Um, the plan. In the plan. In the plan. I think you said the infill is what? 
The infill is... The infill is an organic infill. It's uh, made of cork and uh, uh, coconut palm husks. Yes. And then the, so that, that would be the difference as opposed to some of these other ones uh, where they have the recycled crumb rubber. Right. Okay. I just have one quick question. Courtney, yes. Um, so when, when you were talking about the other things that you wanted to do, like the BAM materials and, you know, things like that, have you looked at that to the point where you can find a quantitative cost for that, no, that so that came up when we started doing this, and we're trying to to, to figure out exactly. I mean, this was a it was a big journey for us because I was a lagoon naturalist. I was in that world before I went to the classroom. I got this awesome job where I got to look at how we could do stuff for the lagoon with this new academy that we have going, and that was one of those big initiatives that I wanted to look at. Now, in that process, I wanted to find out: is this a green? Is this the environmentally friendly way to do it? Because if it's this awful thing for the lagoon is not something that we want to, to put right next to there, especially okay. if we're trying to uh, we're trying to harvest bivalves and we're trying to work with seagrass and mm -hmm. we've got a partnership going with the zoo to work on seagrass. I don't want to do something that would contradict that. Mm -hmm. And when we were going through it, one of the ideas that came about was to add the BAM wall and the gravity drainage to that to allow anything that comes through, if there is more stormwater runoff from the turf field, it could go to that BAM wall. For those practice fields, it could go through that BAM wall. Everything could denitrify to that percentage point before it goes out into the lagoon. Because mm -hmm. I think, like, and this is just me, my idea, but, like, if, if the district was to give you an approval for an artificial turf project, like, that type of stuff that, that um, makes it, better and helps drainage and puts more BAM and, you know, reduces nutrients. I think that's something that I would see this, this funding source to help okay. you with. Um, because I, you're literally the first school I've ever heard talk about wanting to do stormwater improvements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's like a running joke among cities. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yes, that, I think anything like that, I, I see that. I see us maybe wanting to try to help you out with that. Okay. Um, and we're looking for any, you know, like I said, I started working with Ferguson's a little bit because they were giving us idea about uh, green architecture going in, and we're just mm -hmm. trying to make the school as green as humanly possible, yeah. uh, one, because of our location, uh, and two, because of the new CTE program that Correct. we have going in I think place. the combination of any project like that with the CTE program would be awesome. I mean, and I think having, the, you know, any school partner would be even nicer. Um, it's just the artificial turf. I'm really concerned about the district being able to fund that in time for us to fund it with you, you know. Yeah, valid, valid mm -hmm. remark. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you very All much. Right, thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. <coughs> okay, so there is a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. We've had discussion. Um, any other discussion from the committee? Okay, now we need to take public comment. Is there any public comment? Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and vote. Oh, yes, yes, sir. It was on the motion to remove the last two. <laughs> I just guessed from the orange shirt that it was Sunnyland. I, you know, I'm just, just, just guessing. Clint, Clint yeah, I think they, would you like to make a comment? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I know a lot of folks aren't into the aeration deal that I'm talking about. And I've cut my proposal back that I was wanting to do to one canal system. Canal system with aeration, Muck removal, uh, so, you know, getting the salinity back up, oxygen levels back up. Y'all got a lot of different projects going on, a lot of things that happen good, some not. I'm looking for one protected area, and I've cut the price in half to do one major canal system off the Banana River. And I'm just asking y'all, please take a look at what changes I can make in one system, and then come back and look at it. See the progress, not just in the, the water itself, not the conditions of the water, the nitrogens, but the life that we can get going. We've got to start saving our nurseries. After these last storms, we beat up everything we had on the river, from mangroves to oysters and everything else. This is something we can get the homeowners involved in if they can come out and see it. I can advertise, I can get people to come out on the boat and come and see what's going on and see what's happening in those canals to get more people involved. I've got people involved and ready to go on the canal systems I'm on now. So I'm asking y'all to please take a look at it again. Give me the opportunity to do what I can do with one canal system at half the price I got up there. And let me go with it. Give me a chance to do it. You've had other 
aeration projects where they stick three aerators out improperly. I'm talking about things installed the right way. Muck removal will be through bio dredging. In canals that we probably can't even get a dredge system into, we can't get dredge in these little big canals. Give me the opportunity to do it so y'all can be the ones that judge me. Y'all can see the numbers as it goes. I'm not going to throw a bunch of numbers out here that I can't guarantee and that I can't validate. Let it get going. Let it see. Let you see. Let the homeowner see. And just give me the opportunity. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Clint. I have a question. So what differentiates your, your project from the previous two studies that have been done? Can you, can you tell us what, what makes yours different? The fact that I'm going to live it. I'll be there five days a week. I'll be on the canals. I'll be babysitting everything. That is my, basically that's my aquarium. And I'm going to manage it. I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to do it the proper way. And I'm going to babysit it and make it happen. So you, you mentioned benthic much muck dredging. So in addition to the aeration, are you going to do some dredging the in the SMR, canal? The SMR pellets is just adding good bacteria to the system. When you can keep the oxygen levels up day and night and you can keep the good bacteria alive, it can consume with the SMR pellets at an average of about two inches a month. And because of our water temperature is not dropping down below 50 or 57, that bacteria will eat year round. But yes, it's a monthly project where you have to put it in every month at a rate of 13 pounds per acre. We're talking about a pellet the size of an M&M &M with 5 billion bugs in it, basically, to help this go. It's spread out throughout the bottom of the, of the canal. The bacteria are in the water column and everything else. So they're eating from everywhere. They're eating from the base, from the muck levels. They're taking it out, plus they're in the water column. We're also keeping the bag bacteria out because the higher the oxygen levels are, we maintain the oxygen levels, then we actually kill off the anaerobic bacteria and give the good bacteria perfect conditions to do its job. We don't have maintained oxygen levels in the river, and we damn sure don't have it in the canals because of the influx of the fresh water that comes into our canal, especially the larger systems. They are just the salinity so low, uh, oxygen levels are low, and no movement whatsoever. So the idea is this the SMR pellets would be the bio dredging. So I'm taking out two inches throughout the whole bottom of the canal, not just one strip down through the middle and letting everything else left. We're actually starting at the top all the way across the canal and we're eating. But we have to keep the oxygen levels up. And this is not something where everybody's worried about how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to last. The idea is if I can show homeowners that live on canals how much I can remove, how I can bring the sea life back, the idea is to get them involved in the expenses of doing it. The price I'm asking is kind of high, yes, but I'm going to do all these projects at one time. I'm going to be doing the aeration, the circulation, the uh, bio dredging, salt mitigation, orchard habitats, fish habitats to turn that canal system around. Okay. And when we can turn this canal system around completely, and somebody else in another canal or another homeowners association can see that, then I can get them to come in and say, okay, we want to do this with our own dollar. Okay. Laura Lee, did that answer your question? Um, yeah. I assume you're going to use more than three aerators then. You're oh, gonna... yes, ma'am. Okay. The aerators are, to make them work properly, if a canal is 50 foot wide, then you want to have these approximately 100 feet apart, 100 to 120 feet apart. And that's because of the way when they come up, plus the death comes into play. And so when it comes up and it blooms out, when it gets to the edge of the canals, basically you interrupt that nice flow and that nice mushroom. So that determines the width of the canal, determines how far apart they can be to get it to work. I've got the homeowners all loving the idea that I put in the aerator. They will pick up the $15 a month electric bill on these units. Basically, it's their unit. If something's wrong, the bubbles get too large, they call me. I take care of it. So Plus, I'm on the canals every day. So when I see you system that's not performing the way it should, then I take care of it. So the answer is there's going to be more than three aerators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, just one to... One to uh, if we do just what I call canal system B, we're looking around 100 aerators. Okay, thank okay. you. And plus circulation systems. Okay. Thank you. Laura right. Lee, are you good? Yes. Okay. I would just like for y'all to consider this, the opportunity to do one canal, then y'all judge me based on that. 
everything is based on science and numbers. Thank you, Clint. Just my drive to make it happen. I wish I'd take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other public comment? Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. It's been seconded, discussed, and commented. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't want to tell you. That was a nay. That was a nay. Yes. That was a nay. Okay. Thank you, Laura Lee. I, Stephanie, do you? I have a nay as well. Okay, Stephanie has a nay as well. Okay, so it passes five to two. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, those two are, are off. Um, Virginia and Terry, so where are we at now back with the numbers? If we swap the storm water. I already removed yep. I already removed that one from the top, so that'll be the three Banana River basins that are lowest ranked. We removed Mullet Creek muck removal and interstitial treatment, and that gets us to uh, Riverwalk septic to sewer project with 9.153, and then we have a total of 9,163,000 so. to spare. <laughs> okay, so that's under the 9 million that we that we have, but that does include the 1.3 million taken away from the Merritt Island. Utility company, yes. Correct. Now, is everybody okay with, with, with taking that full amount back? I know Todd had mentioned some options. Again, you educated me. You often do. Thank you for that. That would be my one concern is if we did want to go back to the Merritt Island one to talk to them, we may not have funds this cycle. We may next cycle, but there wouldn't be anything in this cycle. Todd, did you want to? I, I would just say, I mean, it, it's not going to be a fast road right. if you're going down that path. So uh, even though I do think we ought to continue to press on that, I don't know what that path looks like, and I would not interrupt things that are ready to go and be funded for the sake of a, of a maybe. So mm -hmm. I, even uh, I spoke up on it. I still think there's actions to be had that may or may not even include funding from here. So uh, personally, I, I would move forward with what you have keep pressing on the other and worry about funding on it later. Virginia. This, um, project number 237, Willow Lakes package plant connection, and a couple rows below that, 239, the Cove at South Beaches package mm -hmm. plant connection. Those two projects add up to about the 1.3, so you're swapping out one package plant connection for two mm -hmm. smaller package plant connections. And the what basin are those in, though? Um, uh, Is it the same? Willow, no. The same region? No? It's not. Okay. So the Cove is in the South Beaches. Willow Lakes is up in Mims. Mims. And, you know, the Merritt Island is Merritt Island. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but I think Todd, I, I'm, I'm, I kind of am 100% with Todd saying if something does happen, it may take a while. And again, if it's an acquisition, I'm not necessarily sure. I think that's what Todd was speaking to, that it would come from this funds if the county ended up wanting to acquire it um, as it would be revenue generating f for them, for possibly. Yes, yeah, Susan? I just had a question for Virginia um, on Project 239 on the Cove. Do you know what capacity that uh, package plan is at? Is that the one, one of the ones that had the sewage spills? No. I, no. Or, no. no. Okay. No, none of, none of us, we, we all get those reports and none of us recall seeing any okay. spills for that one. And do we know what the capacity of that is? I know the, the it code. is 40 townhomes there. I, yeah. I don't know the capacity of yeah. the plant. It's fairly small. Yeah. 10,000 gallons a day. Oh, there you go. 10,000 10, gallons, gallons per day. Okay. Dr. Windsor. I, I, I do have one final quandary for me, and that's I recommended earlier that Mullet Creek not be funded because it's in the South Beaches area, and it's not the area that has been seeing the primary parts of the bloom. And although the Sunnyland Beach properties are very much, I mean, they're, they're here all the time. They've been out doing a wonderful job. The same logic in my mind for saying we shouldn't fund Mullet Creek should be applied to the Sunnyland Beach. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's what I'm struggling with. And maybe you all can help me figure out why we should fund Sunnyland Beach and we're not funding Muller Creek, other than Muller Creek asked for a whole lot more money. Courtney? I mean, I, I just think that the, I mean, the only reason why I was ready to eliminate Muller Creek was because we just didn't have the money to do it. I mean, that's literally the only reason. I think the most, any muck dredging project, and we have a partner that's willing to do that, is something we need to, we need to pursue. Because, um, you know, some of our funding for the muck dredging, of course, you know, was reallocated. Um, I still think it is the most beneficial action that we can take to, to clean up the river and get out that legacy load. And I think when you have a, a whole HOA that's willing to cost share in that, I mean, what better way to, to pursue? I mean, Mullet Creek is, it is basically the whole cost because the county's doing it, right? And so... Um, and, you know, so if we get a, a group that's willing to, to come in and do that and, and put, put their funding in and their, their efforts, I think we, we need to pursue that. For, well, hold, hold on one second. When we get to a motion, we can, we'll, we'll take public comment. Um, I, I know for me, Dr. Winter, it's those additional benefits that you talked about. Um, and uh, this one... I think um, having um, a model that could be reproduced, like with the Cocoa Beach, I, I really think mm -hmm. it's great that they're thinking from a sports complex, how can we treat water? I think that's amazing. And so if we can find a, re a, a, re a reproducible model, um, and I think the Sunnyland one has kind of shown you know, how to get involved. And I, I'm gonna be sending a bunch of people their way, so they best be ready to, mm -hmm. uh, to take calls. Um, because I think it's a good model, but for me, that's that's why I would support it. It's because I think it's a reproducible model um, that we can continue to use. And then let me just clarify: when I say cost share, I mean I'm meaning that the county is going to help them pursue grants to help with the remaining dollars. Like, um, just so you guys don't freak out over there. Um, <laughs> I mean, their HOA isn't going up like yeah. ten thousand dollars. But month. but uh, but the fact that they're here and that they want to, you know, they've been here, um, and the fact that they're putting up their own time and effort to to do something this big is a big deal. Well, and the dollars are, are comparative, comparable. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I think that's the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the things. Oh, oh, Stephanie, please, Stephanie, go ahead. I think that's one of the things that we have been looking for is private partnerships in addition to governmental agencies. And we have one here. And I think that we need to support that. Thank you. Susan. I don't. I had a question for Dr. Windsor. If we eliminated um, Project 236 or didn't fund that, where would you recommend the money go? I, I wasn't going to recommend removing Sunnyland Beach. Okay. I wanted to make sure that everybody understood the benefits for funding Sunnyland Beach. So, okay. like I used to do in my classroom, mm -hmm. okay. I like to ask ask questions I already know the answer to, <laughs> and okay. to promote the discussion to make sure it's understood by the people in the public exactly what you folks said. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So I, 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 I didn't have any plan for spending oh. the money anyplace else. Okay. Thanks. And I got a four-year degree in eight years, so I knew what you were doing there. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, any other comments? Okay. Well, so we, there's no motion on the table. We've had some discussion. Is there a motion? I think we have a list of projects that meet the funding, the funds that are available. So I recommend those projects be funded. Okay, do we, is want, that, is do we that have to clear do it by enough, or would you number? like? Do we have to hold, do it by project on, number? Is that clear enough, or would you like us to get clearer? You have um, a draft motion language that um, the, the, your wonderful uh, vice chair of long ago came up with. Um, and so I think it's phrased, you know, fund everything in the list except, and then you can name those specific project numbers that you want to skip. Okay, I, I don't have that, I know, that, 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 hold on, I'm that, pull it up on that template then. out, but oh. I, I recommend we fund everything on the list, but project number 229, 230, 243, and 244. Does that cover it? I need to add 
I think you need to add the fact that we're recommending to remove we're replacing. the, the we're replacing. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Windsor. The replacements? Sorry, what was that? Uh, we need to recommend removal of the three stormwater projects, correct? I'm, I'm, I'm removing my recommendation and turning this over to Courtney. <laughs> And before the coordinates, oh, okay, can, I, can I just uh, ask, can I address Please. the uh, Esquire? So one of these projects is COCO, and I'm the elected representative yeah, in COCO. Because you're representing a public agency. I think one of the assistant county attorneys already looked into that, so I think Okay, fine, thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, Courtney. <laughs> 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 I was just trying to help. <laughs> but, you always do. Okay, so but I think we're removing three projects from the plan for stormwater and replacing it with the Cocoa Beach Golf Course Stormwater Pond Aquatic Vegetation Harvesting Project number 208. And in addition to that, we're recommending approval of the remaining projects on the list with the exception of 229, 230, 243, and 244. I got that. Okay. Right? So there's I a, move that. There's a motion presented. Mm -hmm. Dr. Winter, would you like to second it? No. Okay. Yeah, second, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's a motion, a second. Is there any discussion? Okay. Stephanie, you're good? I'm good. Okay. All right. So okay. now, now it's public comment time. If anyone from the public would like to make a comment. Okay. One at a time, please just, just come on up. You guys are all in sunny land. I'm not going to pick one or the other one. You're winning. Don't mess it up. And this now. is for the. This is this is on the. This is on the motion that's on the floor. So the motion to approve your plan. And to include us in the. To improve uh, your project. Yeah. Just yes, one sir. more thing for the board. Uh, thank you for uh, hearing us and uh, good morning. Uh, I haven't done this in forever, so I'm going to be a little rough. But several years ago, we came down from Tennessee uh, to retire. Uh, we found a beautiful lot in Sunnyland that had water in front of it. Uh, we actually saw, and I learned, the difference between a bonnet shark and a hammerhead shark. And we saw bonnet sharks in the water off of our seawall. I went out this morning before I drove up here. We can't see anything in the water anymore. We can't see the bottom anymore, and it's only about four or five feet deep. I fell off my jet ski once, and we've got almost as much muck as up to my knees or in the middle of my calf. So we need to do something. Um, now, why would I live there? We bought a 50-year-old house. What can we offer to the county is what I'm trying to say. We bought a 50-year-old house that had termites in it and black mold in it and aluminum wiring which that old is not completely safe. So we had the house taken down to clean sand, and we built a brand new 2,600 square foot house where there was 1,900 square feet. And I promise you all, even though I don't have the numbers, the tax values and the tax rolls went up on that piece of property. There are almost 300 lots in sunny land, and there's many of them built back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s that could be replaced, some of them need to be replaced, some of them it would be a, a voluntary action. But I, I think we have something to offer if we maintain the value of the neighborhood and that water is the value. But the water today won't sell the neighborhood. Thank you so much. Any Thank questions? You. No, sir, we're good. Thank you. And if you want to come down to my place and fish, come on down. <laughs> All right. Is, is there any other public comment, again, on the motion to approve the project? Okay. Go ahead. Yes. So, my name is Melissa Vaughn, and I moved to Sunnyland about a year ago. And the reason I wanted to comment is because I love this community. I love the state that we came from. Um, my kids lost their dad in 2020, and I have five. Uh, five to 19. And, you know, there, I, I don't understand all the, the technology and the, the environmental stuff, but I do know what it means to see my kids look at dolphins, um, you know, at manatees, at the life that the lagoon brings. And so I, you know, I, 
you, that's what the state does, that's what the county does. It brings a lot of emotional support for families like ours. And Sunnyland is Sunnyland. Mm -hmm. And so I just appreciate you guys doing this. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other public comment on the motion? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, it's Laurie Geiser from Sunnyland. I have a question actually. When you make a recommendation, this goes to the county commissioner, goes to a further body for final approval of these projects. Do I understand that correctly? Mm -hmm. So what, what will happen is these, these projects that we talk about today will go into the final project okay. plan, which we'll talk about in January, and then that as a whole will go to the county commission as a recommendation. Okay. As I was looking down these projects from a scientific point of view, I couldn't help but look at the the sheer number of projects that you can potentially fund versus the total number of total nitrogen removed per year. And I want to ask or, or, or potentially challenge, you know, how do you, I don't know how you balance those things when you make the decision on these projects, but that's, that's what I'm looking at. And I have a little bit of concern about Mullet Creek coming out because of its sheer volume of total nitrogen removal every year. And I appreciate as a Sunnylander that the packaging of those two projects could be extremely valuable in terms of total nitrogen together. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll be, I'll be super quick. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, well, hold, hold on one second, Steve. Wayne, what did you say? Uh, do we want to respond to her question? Oh. No. Okay. I think we're just taking that comment now, but we can't. I'll, 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 I'll just make, make, make two quick comments just so everybody's aware. I, I think sometimes I hear the term HOA thrown about. Um, I think Sunnyland actually is not unique in this regard. A lot of these canal front communities were built many years ago. I mean, Sunnyland, I think, was built in the 70s. 60s. 60s, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the HO, what was an HOA, that's all expired now. Um, we, we are basically just, we are just houses in the county. Um, the Sunnyland Beach Property Owners Association, for all practical purposes, we actually are like a nonprofit or whatever, but for all practical purposes, we're like a club. We don't have, it's a voluntary assessment of $50 a year. We do, you know, some basic, you know, services in the community with that. Um, but we can't like assess somebody a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or whatever to say because we've got to do this or that or the other thing. So we are very much reliant on on government and policymakers to figure out what happens, not just with our canal front community, but I think a lot of the other you know, canal front communities um, are in the same boat. Um, whether or not um, canal front properties or, or, or actually any waterfront properties should have some additional assessment. That's a public policy decision. Frankly, it's not one that I would necessarily disagree with. But this gentleman here uh, made an interesting part uh, comment. He says he doesn't want to become, he doesn't want to get on everybody's enemies list. So as the Sunnyland POA guy, I don't want to you know, it's a, ver it's a voluntary thing and you know, we have to try to keep things, you know, Friendly, shall we say. So uh, I know Terry was saying that maybe we have other ways to pursue uh, grant money. You know, there's other sources. You know, I don't know. There's got to be all kinds of things we could probably try to do to fill the shortfall. But I do want to come back to, to Mullet Creek. Um, Mullet Creek is now, there's nobody to care about Mullet Creek other than maybe just some people like Sunnylanders. Maybe we care about Mullet Creek too. The dolphins do, thank you. The dolphins do, the manatees do, the bald eagles, the osprey. Um, so, but it's not like right in somebody's, it's not like something that somebody's like right there saying, hey, this is my backyard, the way the Sunnyland canals are. Um, it was my understanding that this whole project process is, that this isn't, a, this isn't not just a one point in time thing. That, you know, the Sunnyland project, if we can get that approved, and you know that funding approved, then maybe you know get working on that. The the Mullet Creek stuff. I mean, it's probably going to take a couple of years in permitting and everything anyway on these. Maybe next year we can get Mullet Creek in. Um, you know, we're willing to do whatever we can. We write letters. 
knock on doors, whatever, to, to, to make all these things happen. We don't, want, we, don't want to, we don't want to dredge Sunnyland just to have the muck flow from Mullet Creek. So anyway, that's my comment. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Uh, any other public comment? All right, so we'll go ahead and, uh, okay, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Maureen Foster. I've lived in the South Beaches for 36 years in the same house in Sunnyland Beach. I've seen the whole degradation of the entire community and the Mullet Creek Islands and all the subsequent areas that are connected to it. Those there's so much life that used to be in all those canals. There was so much life that was in the Mullet Creek Islands. Unbelievable. But you can go out there right now, and I can tell you in my backyard, you can stand in four to four and a half foot of muck. Just muck. Black, black, like black mayonnaise. It is the most horrible, gross, smelling, disgusting thing you'll ever see. I've just seen the life go down. I've seen dolphins with scars on them that have all kinds of gross that are now growing on them. Uh, we used to even get a few turtles in there. We don't have anything like that. Birds, we had a lot more birds. A lot of the birds are now going to other areas. Uh, you think, there's a misconception that thinks that you're closer to the inlet, so you're really, you're getting wash. No, we don't get any tide. We don't get any tide, we don't get anything in and out. We get wind tide when it's coming in from the hurricanes. Yeah, my house is full of trash, but it is unbelievably underprotected. I think people here just think you're in the South Beaches and you guys don't really matter. Well, we do matter. And we've been there for a long time and I have just seen when the kids would swim in the canals, when I would swim in the canals, man, I'm afraid to even get my foot in there when I'm kayaking. So it has gone, it's totally, it's, it's horrid. It's absolutely horrid. And sooner or later, you're gonna have to address it Sooner or later, everybody's going to have to let either that or you have black water. And you will go out to your restaurants and you can look at water, but there won't be any life in it. You'll see the ripples on the top, and that's as good as it's going to get. So that's all I can say is that please don't undermine thinking that the South Beaches don't need any help because we need a lot of help. And we have been very, very progressive at trying to do the, uh, the septic systems, really trying to, trying to do our best to help the situation. So we're asking you guys this, don't drop us off in the table, don't just throw us down and say, you know, you guys don't really need anything. You know, you have homes there, you should be fortunate. Well, I like to see life out there. I wanna see crabs crawling up my walls. I wanna see it, you know, I wanna see the birds up there. Um, and so it's really a collective office. It's sooner or later, everybody's gonna to have to become involved in it because it will become, as it continues to fracture and get even more it, it eventually, it'll either just be totally destroyed or we will have done something in the positive measure for the rest of mankind, for all your kids, for everything else. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, we got one more. Roxanne, you guys know me, Sunnyland Treasure. Um, thank you for my new septic tank. I think we have 20 new ones and 22 um, on the way. Um, I don't know if you know, but we had two that were pulled up, I think two that had no bottoms in them. So I don't have to tell you where the stuff's going if there's no septic tank bottom out there. Um, Steve's done a phenomenal job with our environmental fair, educating our homeowners, educating the new people that live there. I have an artificial reef. I have the seawall barrier plants. I have the rain barrel. I put in the new septic tank, but when I go in my backyard, it's still brown. So um, I think I'm grateful that you guys are listening and that you're willing to help us because we have to educate the people. We can't do this on our own. And if you'll help us get there, we're going to make it clean. We're going to keep it clean. We didn't make it this way, and you guys didn't make it this way, but we're all educating ourselves on how to make it better. And we have Fuji Clean, who is so excited that we have so many septic tanks that are being installed that have donated 25 motors to help us with aeration once we get this done. And we have the bacteria enzymes that are ready. We're dedicated as a community to keep it clean if you can, guys can help us get it there. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. 
So uh, the motion on the floor, um, as Courtney stated, uh, remove the three storm waters or replace the three storm waters and then remove uh, the ones from the uh, list. So we'll take a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. So now we'll go ahead and go to the next agenda item, Cocoa Beach Maritime Hammock Contingency Request. Terry? Yes. Uh, let's see. Okay. So the city of Cocoa Beach recently finished their Maritime Hammock Stormwater Pond Aquatic Vegetation Harvesting Project. That project had an estimated total cost of $14,500 with Save Our Lagoon funds covering 53% of that at $7,700. The final costs were $14,480, I'll say, it's just because we have pennies in there. And they removed about 143 pounds of total nitrogen based off of their lab report analysis for that pond. Um, they have, based on the plan language, have requested the use of contingency funds to uh, accommodate that extra nutrient removal. So the original uh, contract was for 70 pounds and they removed 143 pounds. So that makes the total cost an additional $6,779.79 for a total cost of 14000 here it is, seven hundred and seventy-nine dollars and forty-nine cents. Okay. So staff is seeking a recommendation from the Citizen Oversight Committee on expanding the funding for this project by an additional six thousand seven hundred and seventy-nine dollars for the higher than anticipated nutrient removal. Okay. So this is because they're removing more nutrients than they had originally anticipated. Mm -hmm. The project is more efficient. Correct. All right. And the, the dollars that, um, so if we were to vote for this, those dollars would then be dedicated to another nutrient removal project, right? In other words, isn't part of our contract that the dollars that the city saves or the municipality saves? I don't think um, they're saving any here. They're asking for, they're asking for, for more. more. Yeah. Okay, they're asking for more. For an expansion, additional money. So the monies that were budgeted, they had budgeted, or they didn't, they had budgeted the other dollars. They're, they're pulling, they're removing more nutrients than they had originally anticipated. Right. And so our right. pound per nitrogen amount uh -huh. would net them an additional $6,800. Okay. Yeah. I think legally we'll have to look at that language. Yeah. Um, the, the. The way this happens, right? They have all the equipment on site. They're doing the work. They're going to move all the weeds. They don't know what the nitrogen content is going to be until, uh -huh. you know, weeks later when they get the content back. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no way for them to ask for that, for the expansion money in advance of doing the work. Mm -hmm. So we may need to look at that legal language and see whether. Because this, these are really a pay for performance contract, unlike our other contingency. There's not an additional uh, expense; they're actually removing more. Yeah. Well, vegetative harvesting is really a pay for performance contract, yeah. as opposed to the other ones that are a fixed dollar amount mm -hmm. contract. So, we'll we'll circle back with the county attorney and and try to make sure we're we're clear on that contract. And then, can you circle back with us on that, Virginia, too, to give us an answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lauren, are you, does that answer yep. your question? Okay. Dr. Recommend Hunter? approval. Okay. There's a motion to approve uh, the contingency request for additional nutrient removal. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Any public comment? Mm -hmm. All right. None. Okay. So we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of uh, approving the contingency request, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, that went through. So 
We're near uh, general public comments. What I'd like to do before we uh, get there is um, what we normally do um, or have done in the past is not had our December meeting. We've canceled it. Uh, we'll get our packets that we can review and then in January come in um, and look at the, the, the next plan update. So is the committee's desire to continue what we've done in the past and cancel our December meeting. Um, we'll get our packet and then we'll come in in January for approval. Um, if there is, I'd look for a motion for that if you'd like to continue. Motion to cancel December and move to January. Okay. Second. All right. Any uh, discussion on that? Any public comment? You guys don't want to come out in December? or <laughs> Really? Sunnyland? Come on, I'll meet you guys here. All right. <laughs> Okay, so uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. All right, so we'll go ahead and do general public comments. Now, I, I did receive a bunch of cards from Sunnyland, but I think everybody is, uh, I'm not going to call on a card. I'll just say if anybody has a general public comment that they'd like to speak, come on up. Hi, I'm Dana Nisipani from Sunnyland, and um, I just want to thank you guys for approving our project, and I want to let uh, Natural Resources know thank you for helping us thus far, and I have some experience grant writing, so I am happy to work with whoever in the county to help uh, our organization move this forward, and um, thank you guys for serving on this committee, giving of your time and your obvious love of the lagoon, and know that you have a lot of allies in Sunnyland. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Virginia, with that comment too, I just remembered uh, NEP, Dr. DeFries has a grant writer on staff that they've offered to uh, mm -hmm. lend help to. So maybe if Sunnyland wanted to reach out, um, we get a bunch of uh, rock star grant writers writing this thing and, and, and then we can fund uh, Mullet Creek. Okay, um, any other general public comment? All right, any, <laughs> any committee comments? Dr. Windsor. I had a quick uh, comment. Uh, at, at our last meeting, we approved some additional funding for, I think it was COCO, mm -hmm. and it went, to the, it went to the Board of County Commissioners, and um, they had some lengthy discussion there about uh, them not getting um, the work in place in a timely fashion, and I thought that left the commission meeting as though they were suggesting there was a two-year time limit on them getting this done. And that made me, that raised the question in the back of my mind, in our contract language, do we, uh, do we have something that says if you don't make progress in two years, we boot you out of here? Is this something new or is this something we've always done? Thank you. So that project had... They wanted, the commissioners wanted to see progress made and the addition, with grants to fund the other half within two years. So that was what came about of that meeting. We don't have anything in our contract mm -hmm. specifying that it needs to be done in a certain time. There is an expiration date on the contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the entities already have something in the works before they mm -hmm. come to us to go into contract. Otherwise, they have to submit blank progress reports, and that doesn't look good. So, so that was not a normal thing. That, 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 was, a, that was a new wrinkle in the, in the whole program. Yeah, they were requesting that additional use of contingency funds to make the 50-50 match for other grant sources. Yeah, I meant that the county commission oh. was, yeah, that, that's a new wrinkle in the process. Thank you. It wasn't, and, and our, our status, progress status was where we put the color coded because we wanted to be able to see with our eyes if a project was not keeping on a timeline that they had originally anticipated. And that would allow us to bring up the issue and say what's going on. Um, so yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you, good question. All right, I go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Three minutes early.
The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period. Thank you.